Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm so happy you came out to join us tonight. It's glad to see a, f uh, a full house. So I am going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to call to order the City Council regular meeting for the City of Santa Paula this Wednesday, October 18th, 2023 at 634. Uh, we will begin uh, with our invocation with Reverend Mandy Sifantus. If you're able to stand, please do so. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members, staff, and all those in the chamber here tonight, the full house, and beyond in our virtual community this evening, will you pray with me? Gracious, loving God, spirit of life, spirit of love and light, by whatever name you call the holy. We are so grateful to be together here in our beloved community of Santa Paula. We are grateful and excited for the celebration that will take place in our city this Saturday for the 150th anniversary of Ventura County. As we come together, we are a diverse city. We do not all think alike. We do not all live alike. We do not all love alike. We are given different gifts and different struggles. May we this night and all nights celebrate the gift of all lives, even as the news of our world touches us here. May your spirit and grace hold us in these times here tonight in this place with these people. And finally, we pray for all those affected in Israel and Palestine by the horrors we have been witnessing from the safety of our beautiful valley. We pray for the families and all those friends we know who are affected and who live in worry and in fear, in grief and in sadness. May they feel our love, may they be surrounded with love and light and support as we pray for peace. May all beings be safe. May all beings be at peace. May it be so. In the name of all that's holy, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Councilmember Juarez, could you lead us in the pledge, please? Feel free to join me in the pledge. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Juarez? Here. Councilmember Crosswhite? Here. Councilmember Chavez? Present. Um, Vice Mayor Corneo? Here. Mayor Sabel? Here. All present. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, we'll have the closed session report. If we could uh, have our, our interim city, city attorney uh, report out on 4B, and I will report out on 4A. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this evening at approximately 4.30 p.m., City Council convened into closed session to discuss the items on the special meeting agenda for A, 4B. With respect to item 4B, Council met on threat to public services or facilities pursuant to Government Code 54957 in consultation with Rich Williamson, Chief Information Officer for the City of Santa Paula. There were no reportable actions taken. Thank you very much. In regards to item 4A, the, it was the public employee performance evaluation pursuant to government code section 54957 uh, as an evaluation of our interim city attorney. So I'm uh, pleased to announce that uh, our council has met. Uh, we performed a per performance review along with the city and staff 
And by un unanimous vote this early evening, we've decided to make her our permanent city attorney. Thank you very much and congratulations. Uh, it turns out that, that it's stuck together so we can't, we can't promote you by yeah. signage right away. So unfortunately. That's, that's fine, I can, I can wait for the new plaque. All right. <laughs> All right, so then uh, given this evening that we do have an agenda item uh, where we have multiple public comments on and that is item uh, 11B. Um, Excuse me for a moment here. So, um, but we also do have uh, item uh, 11A, uh, which uh, a lot of people care about. Care about. So, uh, with the discretion of council, I would like to move 11A up to the top of the agenda, followed by 11B. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So 11A. Uh, this will be uh, presented by our city attorney, Ms. Monica Castillo. Oh. I think our uh, city manager is going to kick this off for us because this has been such a momentous uh, uh, moment for our city in getting the generous donation from Chevron um, to actually own the oil uh, Union Oil Building. And um, Mr. Singer, if, if you want to uh, just provide that, um, those events leading up to, to this item. My apologies. Yes, so this is item 11A, the oil museum? Yes, sir. So sticking with the past protocol, I do have an actual conflict and a perceived conflict. So I would like to recuse myself and leave the room. Thank you very much. We'll call you back when we're done. And Mr. Mayor, I understand we're having trouble with our live streaming, so that's why the clerk has stepped away for a minute. Um, uh, but with that, and hopefully our uh, guest from Chevron is able to, to hear us, um, I just wanted the opportunity to uh, introduce this item, especially for the public's sake. The um, city is in really remarkable position tonight to enter into a transaction that will really change the uh, face of the community for hundreds of years in acquiring this iconic uh, facility known as the uh, Union Oil Building and the adjacent property and parking lot. And we're just uh, really appreciative of the gift by Chevron, um, by their wisdom to also give us support knowing that this is an old uh, building that needs a lot of attention. And, um, and this is really, I think, a turning point. Separate from tonight's action, which is really just a transaction, um, we are undertaking a community process to look at how the facility gets used. Um, the council appointed an ad hoc subcommittee to work with staff. We've held a series of community workshops and we are now in the process of looking to put a request for proposals out as to solicit uh, input and proposals on, on how the uh, museum could, could be used in the future. So I just wanted to point out that that's a, a separate action from tonight. Um, but with that, have the attorney go over the terms of the agreement that's before you. And then you have uh, Mr. Moore from Chevron that uh, could be available to answer questions along with staff members who have put a lot of effort into this, namely Greg Barnes as uh, the person who oversees our facilities as we've been doing due diligence and also James Mason who's helped with the appraisal and the title report and code issues. Uh, thank you, City Manager Singer. Um, so getting into the drier uh, details of this transaction. Um, the city is paying $1 for the property and $10 for memorabilia and other items that are stored there. Um, another uh, detail is that we agree to close the transaction and be owner of the property by December 31st of this year. Uh, 
once the agreement is signed, we have 45 days to complete our due diligence, which is an inspection of the property, um, including looking at any sort of uh, encumbrances on title, um, environmental conditions. And once that 45 day due period, uh, due diligence period ends, we will not be able to terminate the agreement based on the property conditions. Um, and once the sale closes, we accept the property as is and where is. However, we can before closing terminate, um, though we would be uh, liable for up to $20,000 in, uh, in costs that uh, Chevron may have incurred. Um, and once the property is transferred to us, um, we will be agreeing to certain uh, re claim releases and indemnity uh, provisions, um, which is comes with risk, but I think it's a, a worthwhile deal since we are going to own this great property, no longer be the tenant, and can use it to uh, foster programs and community uh, events in Santa Paula. Um, if the city sells the property to a new owner, um, we then transfer those liabilities to them, but uh, Chevron will have the reasonable discretion only to release us from our duty to indemnify them for any uh, third party claim. Um, we will be um, jointly liable um, for any claims that result um, both uh, among ourselves and successor owners unless Chevron agrees to release those liabilities from us. And the exciting part here is that we are receiving a generous grant of $2 million um, to go towards the deferred maintenance of the property. And I know that was a, a very uh, big concern for the city um, given the conditions of the property and knowing that we really wanted to rehabilitate that and make sure that it was in its uh, highest quality of operations and that would have uh, been a huge expense to the city without Chevron's generous donation to cover $2 million of those costs. Uh, and not only that, if there is money left over um, from that $2 million, we are able to place that into an endowment fund and that can generate uh, more money for ongoing maintenance um, for um, the future of that oil museum and property around it. Um, also, the city, in conjunction with receiving that grant, is required to prepare something called a deferred maintenance plan. And that is something that is um, has been started, and I think it's largely done. And our uh, Parks and Recs director, uh, Mr. Barnes, can answer questions about that if there are any. Uh, questions of title can be answered by our economic and community development director, Mr. Mason, if there are questions about title and appraisal. And uh, for the def uh, deferred maintenance plan, uh, that's going to detail for us what funds can be used to pay for. That plan will set out the costs of building components and the cost of those repairs, and we will be limited to um, using the funds for those repairs. Again, anything that's left over will be put in an endowment fund for uh, future ongoing maintenance. Uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. I can certainly get into the, the provisions of the agreement if you have questions there. Thank you for the report. Council, uh, Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, our new legal counsel, permanent legal counsel, Monica Castillo. Um, I just want to make sure, since we have a lot of people here, so it's an educational opportunity to let folks know that the oil museum is protected under the Mills Act. Can you can you validate that information? And if it's protected by the Mills Act, what does that mean in particular to ensuring the integrity of the historical landmark? Right. So the Mills Act protects uh, historic facilities, and um, we will not be able to alter the facade of the facility, um, but we are able um, to go in and um, do different, uh, apply different uses um, to the interior as long as it preserves uh, the historical facade and significance. 
Thank you. Councilmember Crosswhite. Um, I have a qu couple of questions. My first question is, are we required to use a title company for $11? And, and what, do they, what role do they perform? So there's, there is no requirement to use that. That's uh, something that's contractually agreed to. Um, but I, it is standard practice. And for something of this uh, significant, of great significance, I would recommend going through title. And that's something that um, we have already consented to with um, Chevron. So what, what functions do they perform so, in addition to the? So going through, money? there's a uh, process called escrow. And there is an escrow company and a title company. Usually they're one in the same. Uh, the escrow company will is responsible for making sure that we check all the conditions prior to a purchase. Um, the agreement lays out these preconditions to a purchase. And so if they're kind of like this third party that uh, makes sure both Chevron and the city are uh, checking their boxes and they'll be that go between and let each side know when the transaction has been satisfied. Um, and they, we also let them know when we are waiving a condition to purchasing and closing on the transaction, transaction the same way that Chevron can do for us. So it's just a great uh, facilitator and, and third party mediator if there are um, any sort of um, deposits that are made or in the case of a, um, a dispute, we can let them know that we're terminating and they can help us document that. If I can insert a quick aside. So in the packet, it mentions that maybe the original de deed uh, was granted in 1864, so it's not, I find that very interesting. And so then it talks in here about confidentiality. How does that work with the Brown Act and what is confidenti confidential under this agreement versus not? So the, I believe you're referring to a section. Uh, page 696. 696, yes. Or page 10 of the agreement. So that would be section 3.2.1, sub C, um, transferee, meaning the city will keep confidential information resulting from inspections and will deliver to transferor, which is Chevron, copies of all reports, surveys, studies, um, and so on generated by inspections. Uh, we, transferee can disclose this confidential information to transferees' representatives to the extent it's needed uh, to evaluate the property. So they've agreed to allow us to share that information um, with you, Council, um, because you are assessing the property. Um, and Chevron is aware that under the Brown Act, something, a contract like this needs to be disclosed to the public. And so while Normally, contracts might be held confidential. The Brown Act requires disclosure to the public. Um, for the documents in here, we, are, we cannot distribute our environmental reports um, until they have been, um, uh, until it's been concluded, until this transaction's been concluded. And once that is done, then we are obligated under the Brown Act if requested to release those because they are then a public record. So the, the reason for that then would be if for some reason the city found something and then decided not to purchase the property, the current owner wouldn't necessarily want that to be public information. Is that the kind of, or what would be the reason for having that in there? I mean, it would be my speculation of why that would want to be held confidential. Um, I would. I can see uh, if it were uh, this, the city's property and it didn't want to disclose its environmental reports, that might be for liability reasons, it might be for other exposure, but. Not that, that we have any reason yeah. to believe that there's anything. <laughs> yeah. But, um, can I? So then it talks in the contract uh, a couple of pages later about exceptions. What? would be that in the title review, what would be an exception 
that could be found that wouldn't would maybe not be released so in in they're called preliminary title reports they have a, a schedule that lists exceptions and exceptions means that the title company will not ensure those um, defects in title for example um, like un undisclosed easements that are not on record um, so say somebody had a, a right to uh, build a, a trail through the oil museum property and we weren't aware of that title is is not going to ensure that kind of dispute over the easement and property rights. So that's an example of a type of exception that they will not cover. And we'll know if there's anything like that before we get to the end of discovery, most likely. Correct. And so that's the 45 due diligence period that, that I had mentioned earlier in my report. And then I presume the, the language in there about the gentleman's family who still has mineral and oil rights, that would be if for some reason and someone decided they were going to drill for oil on that site, which doesn't seem real likely that family would get the proceeds. Is that what that means? Or right, right, yeah. Okay. So if they want to come and drill oil, which I'm pretty sure doesn't exist anymore, um, they could get that. All right. I might have other questions, but I'll let, in case anyone else has questions. Thank you. I just want to remind folks it's the Union Oil Building, not the Oil Museum. So thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. Um, my question is for Director Barnes. Um, I know from the ad hoc, hoc committee um, that we met with some of the archivists from Chevron, and so they were go going to the museum to assess what was theirs, what they had, what they would take. Will that all, that could be a question for actually both, how is that going? And then my question for um, City Attorney Castillo would be, um, <coughs> will all that need to be taken care of and retrieved before close of escrow? So let me start with the first. So as you know, they were here um, last month or early this month for their initial visit. They will be back. We don't have an exact timeline on what that looks like, but we are looking to try and do that before the end and the close of escrow. Um, I'll defer to our city attorney on whether or not that needs to be tied to the agreement, um, but that is well underway, and we're working with them on that process okay. currently. So, yeah. so then would there be a, a listing then of things that they're taking or things that they're leaving? Are we yes. in hand in hand with that process as yeah, well? They'll, then, they'll so. give us a list of what they're, I don't want to say requesting, but they'll give sure. us a list of what they're interested in, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure there will be a discussion between the city and Chevron. Um, we've already had discussions of some of those items could even be digitized so that both parties can still have access to certain items. But we're not quite sure what they're interested in yet. Right. So it kind of depends. But yeah, there, there will be a list of then what's left. We're also working on an independent inventory of items mm -hmm. that are in the building. So we'll have uh, our own you know, list, per se, too, of what's there, what belongs to the city, and, and what not as well. OK, thank you. And then, so is that? Now, I'll just add that. Um, there is a way that we can uh, amend the agreement. The goal is to uh, finalize this list before closing mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Um, there is always the option of either waiving that condition and making it a post-closing condition so that they can finish a, a more thorough uh, inventory of, of the items that are there. Um, and, and still close by year end -ish. Yeah, we'll still then, close yeah. by year end and okay. then conclude the right. inventory process afterwards. Yep. Keep the transaction separate if needed. Yeah. Okay. But the goal is to complete it we can. as one process. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Councilmember Crossway, you have more questions? Just a couple. Um, is, will it be at all problematic in the definitions at the beginning? It defines business days as Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and legal holidays. But in the section on page 30, uh, 15.6, it defines it as Saturday, Sunday, or legal holidays. Is there any chance that we could get into a disagreement over the inclusion or not of Fridays as a business day? No, there, there it's very low likelihood that there would be. And um, 
since this is such a cooperative relationship, I don't think that that would create an issue if something were to occur on a day when the city is closed on a Friday. Um, and then I think my other two things are, one's a, a statement and one's a, a question, a larger question. So should we move forward with this? I think it's a, maybe a question for Greg or the subcommittee. Um, at what point will the proposed RFP for proposals on the property come back to the council for review before it's circulated? Do we have a rough? Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, the subcommittee is meeting tomorrow yes. to review a proposed scope of work and a draft RFP. If that goes well, I would think we'd have it out on the street no later than the end of the month. I think we would want to float it for at least, at least 30 days, um, probably more. But it won't come to council before it's floated? The RFP? Right. Because a lot of times if we're doing an RFP on something, it comes to the council so that the full council can the, just see. If it's the council's pleasure to, and, and the subcommittee thinks it's a. I'm not sure if this is a discussion we can have right now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we should probably limit the discussion on that. But, but we um, can certainly bring the scope of work and the RFP to the council first. If I can say, I would be more comfortable with that. Um, and then just a comment in terms of the, um, it, the, if there is money that ends up being in an endowment, that's probably something we should have a policy around. But I'll just leave it at that. All right, any further questions or comments? All right, is there a colleague who would like to take action? Okay. Vice Mayor. Thank you, I hadn't turned off my mic. <laughs> um, I would move that we authorize the city manager to execute the proposed transfer agreement to acquire the Union Oil Building property and all documents necessary to carry out the transfer agreement uh, and Authorize acceptance of the property pursuant to the government code section 27281. And second. It, it, well, it's worded a little different, and we're adopting resolution 7488. Sorry, I missed that first line. Yep. Resolution 7488. Correct. Thank you. So we have a motion by Cornejo, a second by Chavez. Any further discussion? Well, good. So all in favor say aye. 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 Anybody against? Say nay. Uh, motion carries uh, uh, four to and Councilmember Juarez has been recused. All right, we now own the Union Oil Building. Yay. Well, sorry, I, I take that back. We're in process of owning it. Thank you very much. All right, if we could uh, have uh, Councilmember Juarez step back in. Mr. Mayor, if our clerk would like to make an announcement while we're awaiting Council Member Juarez's return. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did want to announce that we are currently having some difficulties with our software on the automatic working and running a live stream. Um, we are still recording this meeting, and we, um, the IT department has verified that we can put the minutes or the recording on our website tomorrow, though this evening um, the public is not able to watch from home. What about Channel 10, though? Right. Channel 10 as well. The server is not running Channel 10 right now. And just out of curiosity, would there be, I mean, is it a five-minute issue, or we're, we're just done? If, well, right now I would say it's not working unless while they're trying to do resets and that type of thing, it will just automatically start working again. Um, my biggest concern for myself as a clerk is making sure that we have a recording for the public, which we will be able to put out tomorrow. All right, so uh, if council's okay, we'll go ahead and proceed with 11B, but we could uh, have, a, we do have a staff presentation we could do meanwhile. Does anybody have any brothers either way? Well, it sounds like they've been working at it for 35 minutes now, right? Correct. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. So we'll go ahead and move on to item 11B, uh, the flag display policy. The recommendation is that the city council discuss, amend, 
amending the flag display policy and if amendments are required, requested, direct staff to return with an adopting resolution at a future meeting. And this uh, will be presented by our city attorney. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, so tonight, this is a discussion of amendments to the city's existing uh, flag display policy. <clears throat> the city's current policy does not allow for what is called commemorative flags at city facilities. And currently the only permitted flags are the US flag, the state flag, the city flag, and at Veterans Memorial, uh, the POW and MIA missing in action flag are, is also allowed to be displayed. A request came from our fellow council member, uh, Pedro Chavez, um, to bring this item before discussion uh, to today uh, to see if the city would amend its pride prog uh, amend its policy to uh, allow for the display of the pride progress flag. And that would be flown um, every year during Pride Month, which is June of each year. Um, so along with your uh, report, we included prior reports on this item that gives background of leading of what led up to the policy that council currently has in place and adopted uh, just a couple years ago. Um, so that was provided um, to help uh, provide others background, the public background, and to remind uh, some of the council members here of what uh, led to the current policy today. And um, I will go ahead and allow for a discussion that those prior reports do include some in-depth legal discussion, and I'm happy to answer questions of legality as they come up in your discussion. Thank you. So before we go to public comment, are there any specific questions that any council members would like to ask of our City Attorney. All right. So we'll be moving into public comment. Uh, do we have all the cards up here? I have some more. I'm still logging here. Okay. Before you get through those, I'll have them. So, uh, just a moment, please. All right, so we have roughly 35 public comments. Um, at the discretion of the mayor, I could reduce our time from three minutes to some other number, like two minutes. But uh, for now, I think I'll go ahead and leave it at three minutes. But I ask everybody to be concise. Uh, try not to be repetitive. If somebody's saying the exact same thing, you can just acknowledge that. Um, and I also ask that everybody listen with respect and let's uh, not Let's avoid clapping and, uh, and uh, you know making all sorts of uh, sounds of encouragement or discouragement. So, if we're all ready to go, I'll go ahead. And uh, these are more or less the order that they were received. So, um, we'll be starting out with Mr. James McKeeran, I think. Sorry about that. Hi, my name is James McEachern. I, uh, I'm a resident of uh, Santa Paula. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, the council and the residents the legacy that, and relationship that we have with Hollywood. Um, when I first moved here, uh, I lived with uh, 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 one of the stars of RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, here in the city, so we have a creative spirit, and uh, it would be nice to welcome that creative spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we'll have John Finley, and followed by uh, Johannes Moln. Um, I, uh, it should be on, so please uh, just stand close. 
Yeah, thank you to the Santa Paula City Council for the work you do on behalf of the city. The town is beautiful and thriving. My children attend school in Santa Paula. We enjoy shopping and dining in the town. We've recently returned to the area and are grateful for the flowers that line the streets, the shops and businesses, and the wonderful community. It recently came to our attention that the City Council will be voting on whether to allow the pride flag to fly from public flagpoles during the month of June. And to our mind, this flag represents a movement that runs counter to much of the heritage present in the people and history of Santa Paula. It is also associated, among other activities, with um, public libraries hosting drag queen story hours for children. And to our mind, that's not a flag that should be publicly promoted. Uh, if Santa Paula decides to fly the pride flag during the month of June, my family and I will not shop at or support businesses in the city during that month. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration of this matter. Thank you. All right, so then we'll have John Moln, if I got that correctly, followed by Viva Moln. And Mayor City Council, uh, my name is Johannes Monle. Uh, we purchased our home here in Santa Paula around seven years ago and moved here and it's, we're delighted with the community and it's, it's fun and it's really nice to live here. Um, we just recently found out about this pride flag thing and I, I also read that there's a current policy where the city displays it. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't know what the current policy is. Uh, do, do we display it on, on the month of June right now or not? We do not. Not. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I would uh, request that you uphold the current policy. And from my personal perspective, uh, Americans are generally generous people, and uh, everybody can do whatever they want. And that doesn't mean that I have to agree with anything, and I'm not quite frankly not interested. And certainly, through the public display of a flag like this, don't want to be personally be associated with something. I think that's a private matter. And uh, therefore, I request that things remain the way they are. Thank you. Now we'll have Viva Monle, and uh, followed by uh, Brian Kelly. Hi, my name is Viva Monley, and I want to thank the council for the service that you do for this community. And we did move here recently after eyeing this community for about 20 years, um, planning to retire, but we ended up coming during the pandemic, which is sort of a crazy time to be moving, but are just really appreciating so much that is here in this community. And now um, we have two of our children living here and six of my grandchildren. So I am um, a grandmother, a mother of four, grandmother of 10. I'm also a, reg a registered nurse and a graduate of UCLA. Um, I have a, I'm the mother of a Marine. So there's a lot of flags that I could fly in our home. And I'm really grateful that we live in a place where we can fly the flags that we want and speak out. Um, in the way that we want to. I, so I thank you for this opportunity before this council. I uh, agree with my husband, Johannes, that I think the most appropriate flag for a government facility um, is the American flag and the current policy that you have. I also appreciate what you've just, um, how you have established a room for POWs and MIAs and the Veteran Memorial Park. So I just wanted to voice that opinion and thank you again for your service. Thank you very much for your comments. All right, uh, Brian Kelly followed by Jesus Jimenez. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've lived in Santa Paula since 1996 and I would like to speak in opposition to amending the policy. I've been struck that in our country, um, political rhetoric has become very inflamed and I sort of asked myself, how is it that in Santa Paulo, people who think so differently can get along so well? And I think the current policy is part of, a, part of what makes that possible. Um, and I think it allows city government to avoid stepping into inflammatory issues um, that would uh, certainly inflame the rhetoric in town. Um, 
So I think the policy as it stands exhibits a real prudence and I would urge that we retain this wise policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Jesus Jimenez followed by Brittany Botts Velasquez. Velasquez, I'm sorry. Um, hello, uh, thank you guys for your time. I'm here to talk to you about action item 11B, the flag display policy. I wanna thank everybody for coming up and speaking on their point of view and thank you for having this discussion. My time's off by the way. Oh. So. Um, while I'm in a good place today, I want to speak on the importance of having symbols of pride and acknowledgement for young people. When I was a young child, my parents did not understand what queer culture was and often put it down in my presence. On top of that, I grew up in a time when I would turn on the news and see people of queer backgrounds being left for dead for being who they were. I knew I was gay, but I felt so alone in the world. If I had adults and symbols um, making me feel welcome for being gay, I probably wouldn't have had thoughts of suicide for being born the way I was. The decision you guys make today might seem trite, but it's not. You guys have an opportunity to save a life tonight by this little simple gesture of raising a flag. Some, uh, to Santa Paula's youth, you were saying we acknowledge you exist. You were saying you're not alone. You were saying you will be okay. As a teacher, I have had the misfortune of hearing how my story is not unique and that it continues to this day. My students still hear from their family members how being queer is not okay and they still turn on their TVs to see people of queer culture being killed. That said, I have also been lucky enough to have had dozens of students thank me for acknowledging them and supporting them and not making them feel alone. Please be that person for the youth of Santa Paula. Please give them hope. Please let them know they will be okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Brittany Potts Velasque, followed by uh, Susan McEachern. Sorry. Hi, guys. McEachern. Um, so my sister says she can see us on the live feeds. So. I think it's going off. Okay, well, just letting you know. Okay, <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, hi, Mayor. Hi, members of the City Council. I'm Brittany. You all know me. Um, I wanted to start out by saying I don't envy any of you all. I know how big of a decision this is. I know that you guys carry the weight of 30,000 people every day, everything that happens in this town on your shoulders. With that being said, um, as I was thinking about what I was gonna say tonight, I had so many moments of just feeling like, how are we still having these conversations? I'm tired. I don't know how you guys are. Um, I'd wanna be home right now, not sitting here fighting for, this, for a flag that literally stands for equality, inclusion, diversity, kindness, and acceptance. No matter what anybody comes up here and says, that's what that flag stands for. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing bad about it. It was raised once. The town did an uproar. The drag queens didn't come in and take over our libraries. Life went on. It was a good and positive thing. Um, when it comes to um, going backwards, you really can't do that on inclusion and equality things. I think that we have a really big opportunity tonight to stand on the right side of history. Um, and make the right decision for our community. It's, again, not a flag that stands for just being gay. It stands for a lot more, and especially in today's day. I am, uh, have lived in Santa Paula since 1989. I am fifth generation, and I've always known this town to be filled with people who feel marginalized and so I don't know this side of Santa Paula that um, would be so upset or this doesn't represent us, the opposite the opposite. Um, no matter what you decide, I will always support the shops here in town. I will always support business here in town. And um, this flag, again, represents kindness, not threats, not it's this or that. Um, and I hope that we can move forward today and um, show our community that, you know, this isn't anything to be afraid of. It's 2023. Let's wake up and let's just all, you know, be kind. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Susan McKeekern. I got that right, uh, followed by David McKeekern. My 
wife's time. I'm Dave McEachern, uh, former president of PFLAG uh, Santa Clarita. I've been a resident here uh, 16 years or so. Okay, I want to tell you what this flag represents. This flag represents welcome. Welcome to all people of different sexual backgrounds. Welcome to a diversity of people. That's what the flag represents. So we have a choice here. It's actually a, a national choice. Other people will be looking at this and reporting what you do today. Okay, this will be reported in the LA Times, uh, the decision you make. Are you gonna be an inclusive city or one that uh, d doesn't include people, everybody? So as you make this decision, um, I urge you to uh, look at this flag as a welcome mat, saying welcome. Welcome to everybody. Um, and you can see a lot of people have very uh, strong opinions about this. I do. Uh, but I, I do want you to, to know that um, California, uh, uh, many cities, are going ahead and raising this flag up. Uh, cities that tear it down uh, sometimes suffer uh, loss of income. Um, Huntington Beach, I'll take for example. Uh, somebody was saying they weren't going to shop here. If our movie industry decides they don't want to do business with Santa Paula because we're in a uh, city that doesn't allow gay uh, flags and so forth, that'll be hurtful. So I'm going to urge you to think of the big picture of all the cities all over the United States that are facing the same issue and get on the side of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have uh, Karen Collins followed by Melissa Wadzinski. Hi, um, Mayor Sobel and council members. Thank you for, um, for inviting us here to talk about this. Um, I, uh, listening to all these um, statements, I think the one flag that shows the most inclusiveness is the flag we do fly which is the American flag. It's the flag that unites us. I'm an immigrant to this country, and I love it here. I've been here 20, almost 27 years, and I think the people of Santa Paula are kind and respectful to each other, and we know that we can be united under this flag. There are a lot of issues, there are a lot of concerns, there are a lot of people who are marginalized for various things, and we could just take turns flying different flags for everybody, but really this flag is what represents um, the future, the good future that we all have possible because we live here in Santa Paula. Thank you. So I, I, I just want to make sure we keep the amendment as it is. Or we don't amend the policy is what I mean to say. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Melissa Wazinski, followed by Nicole Sutherland. Hello, thank you, Mayor Sobel, council members, and staff. My name is Melissa Wodzinski. I've been a Santa Paula resident and homeowner for 21 years, raising four children here with my husband. My hair was brown back then. <laughs> um, I live, worship, shop, and volunteer in Santa Paula. I urge you not to amend the city's flag display policy that was adopted in January of 2022. This current policy is reasonable. It strikes a judicious and balanced use of our public flagpoles for displays of emblems that are not indicative of political and moral sentiments, nor are polarizing to our community. The proposed amendment to the current policy being considered at tonight's meeting is quite the opposite. Instead, the proposed amendment unfairly favors a subset of the populace while emphatically closing the door to other viewpoints which may differ in substance or approach. Such a refusal to admit a level and open consideration of disparate opinions in the public square runs contrary to the First Amendment of our nation's constitution and to the sensibilities of fair-minded people. 
Thank you for voting to uphold the city's current flag display policy. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. All right, so uh, Nicole Sutherland and followed by Mary Block. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Sobel and council members. I am in favor of keeping the policy as it stands. I'm a resident of Santa Paula, a school teacher here in our town. I love our town. I love our children. And for their sake, let's keep things as they are and uphold America as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mary Block, uh, followed by Benjamin Block. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Block, and I've been a resident of Santa Paula for almost 30 years now, and I'm in favor of keeping our current policy. I agree with those who have said that it seems like a, a prudent and non-divisive policy. I also agree that the American flag is, um, is in itself inclusive. I do just want to say, because I don't know if it's been said yet tonight, that not wanting to fly the Pride Progress flag is not, certainly on my part, not, um, not meant to be a lack of welcome, but just I think that our government flagpoles are not appropriate places for flags that do represent partisan groups. Um, it's definitely not a bipartisan movement. There's a lot of people who are behind it for reasons of great kindness. There are other people who are much more aggressive in promoting agendas that certainly are not widely agreed upon. So I just, I think that our current policy is um, a non-divisive and a very good one that makes sense to me. I'm in favor of keeping it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, Benjamin Block followed by Chris Ol Olson. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I've been a resident of Santa Paula for, for five years now and I strongly object to the proposal to amend the current policy. Um, I do want to be clear um, that this is not opposition to equality. It's not opposition to kindness. But uh, instead, it is opposition to yeah, what I think is a very partisan agenda and certainly not a majority agenda. Um, there's an agenda that stands behind the flag. And it's to fly it would be falsely to falsely propose it as being emblematic of the beliefs of the majority of Santa Paulans, and that's, and that's not true. So I, I would like to ask those who are in favor of amending it to imagine if the situation were reversed. Um, imagine if we proposed flying a flag that said, support family. I don't think anyone is against supporting families, but I think people would wonder, is there an agenda behind that that is in support of something I don't believe in? Um, and, and yeah, I think there would be some opposition to, to a flag that said support family, even though no one's against supporting families. I don't think anyone here is against equality. I don't think anyone here is against kindness. So similarly then, it, it is offensive and I think disingenuous to propose that Santa Paulans support the LGBTQ plus agenda, which I think goes much beyond the rather innocuous sounding equality, the innocuous sounding kindness. I think the flying of this flag would truly be undemocratic propaganda, and yet another instance of um, what is becoming too common, rainbow bullying. To those who support this change in policy, I would kindly ask them not to try and force their personal beliefs upon those who have a different view than them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chris Olson, followed by uh, Jan Becker. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council members. Um, I want to express my support for the existing flag policy. It is very reasonable. I think our public symbols should signify things that citizens across the board uh, can stand behind. Um, the proposed amendment to privilege the Progress Pride flag um, does not seem to do that. It, uh, um, yes, I, I understand the, the rhetoric of equality and acceptance. Um, the Progress Pride flag uh, it seems to signify more. It seems to me involved in the Progress Pride flag is the notion that, uh, for example, um, the human species is not naturally differentiated into male and female, which are complementary. 
Um, <clears throat> that is a highly contentious and divisive, divisive opinion. So to uh, change the policy to privilege uh, a flag that is signifying something that is, um, yeah, so controversial and is causing such social tension um, seems to me the height of inequity. Uh, so I just encourage you to uh, uh, keep the policy as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Becker followed by Thomas uh, Wiesbecker, I believe. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can't hear anyone back there, so I hope you can hear me. Um, so good evening, Mayor and Council members and members of our community. Um, I'm asking you please not to change the current flag policy. I see no reason to do so, and no reason is given why this change is needed in the documents I saw, nor why the pride flag must be allowed, but no others. As you know, a staff report was prepared in 2021 by the current city attorney, congratulations on your appointment, um, which summarized flag policies of several other California cities. A friend of mine who's an attorney reviewed them and noted absolutely none of those have policies that provide any special treatment for the pride flag. Why would Santa Paula do so? The current policy works. It allows us to show our city support for our country, for our uh, state, California, and Santa Paula. It does so in a way that does not invite every interest group that exists to request that a flag be flown in its honor, nor does it invite unwanted lawsuits. Additionally, the policy states that the prisoner of war missing in action flag may be flown in Veterans Memorial Park. It is certainly fitting that we should honor our veterans at the very least with a flag in a park that is named in their honor. Besides this, the POW MIA flag has been nationally and congressionally recognized. In my opinion, we cannot overvalue our veterans and the many sacrifices they have made for our country, nor should we ever hesitate to honor them publicly. I do not think we can say that about the pride flag. Some people want that particular flag to be grandfathered into our policy. Why is that? Is it the one and only cause that merits having a flag raised in its honor more than any other cause or issue? I don't think so. While I have compassion for my fellow citizens who consider themselves represented by the pride flag, other Santa Paulans have our own challenges too and yet it's not clear that we need to raise a flag to each and every group that represents such people. I don't think our city council is here to act as a juridical body that determines the rights and merits of certain groups in their various flags. Let's keep our elected city officials focused on the many other tasks at hand in the governance of Santa Paula, and things that are more suited perhaps to our local political well-being. If, however, it seems necessary to you to rewrite this policy, to prohibit all flags except for the pride flag, and that is what it is saying, um, let me challenge you to give Santa Paula citizens very compelling reasons for this extreme preference of one issue, one cause. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council, and all city staff for your really, truly tireless service, I know it is, to our city and community. And I thank you for considering what I have said. Thank you. Right, uh, Thomas Weisbecker, uh, followed by Mary Bagdays. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council, and thank you, uh, Council Member Chavez, for bringing this to uh, to us. Um, I support uh, changing the policy so that we can fly the flag. My remarks are sort of off the cuff, so I apologize if they're a little scattered. I just wanted to. Uh, respond to some of the remarks that, that have been made here this evening. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to let you know that if you disagree with us, uh, my heart goes out to you. And uh, I, I, I do believe that I feel like I understand where you're coming from. I just, uh, again, I, I don't agree. Uh, we are a, cr a community in crisis. And so that is the reason for this petition. And if you want to fly your own flag, uh, please bring uh, a petition before this council and fly your flag. We're asking you, please, we are in crisis. Uh, we are uh, killing ourselves. We are having emotional and all kinds of psychological issues. Now, you may say that's because we're gay. 
I, again, I want to tell you, if you think that being queer is a choice, I, I got news for you. I don't want to be rude, but it implies that you think that your sexuality is a choice, that you've chosen to be straight, which again, I think you might want to look at that very carefully. So um, I want to tell you an anecdote, if I may. I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, when I was uh, in graduate school, I went to a pride event in, in West Hollywood, and there I encountered the Westboro Baptist Church, which you may be familiar with. And I learned all about Fred Phelps and Shirley Phelps Roper, who is now the pastor of that church, I believe, or she was last when I checked. I had multiple interviews with her for my thesis. And uh, their, their thesis, if you will, is that God hates fags. And you may recall the signs that that's what they fly at the, at the meeting or anywhere where we congregate. God hates fags. Now, you may think that that's abhorrent, which I certainly do. God doesn't hate anyone. And certainly using the epitaph or what, excuse me, you know, fags, that's, again, abhorrent. But that is effectively what you're saying. It's not a subtle message. God hates fags. Because we're not asking for much. We're just asking for one month of the year, fly our flag because we are in crisis. God doesn't hate fags, and sexuality is not a choice. Not one of us, has, I mean, forgive me, I can't say that, but I certainly didn't choose it. My husband is here of 10 years, and it wasn't until I married him that I was blackballed from the Catholic Church. For, for 10 years I worked for the Catholic Church, and it was only when I finally decided to dedicate my life to one man that I was blackballed and, and alienated from my people. So shame on you. Please help us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Mary Bagdasian, followed by uh, Greg Becker. That's a pretty hard statement to follow. Um, I'm a Christian, and I would say I don't hate homosexuals, and I believe God does not either. Um, Good evening, everyone. Thanks for allowing us to speak tonight. I've lived in Santa Paula for more than 23 years, and I appreciate all the hard work that you all do. I know you put in a lot of hours. Just looking at Pedro's schedule that you had printed out, that's super impressive how much time you put into meeting people in the community. I do believe that our flag policy should not be amended um, as it stands with the U.S., California, and POW MIA flag, I think it should stay at that. When you made that decision, I think that was in 2022, the pride flag was flown, I believe, in 2021, and then that was objected to by community members. Is that correct? Am I correct in that understanding? Okay. And then a proposal was made by community members to the council to allow the pro-life flag to be raised in October, which is pro-life month, if the pride flag was to be allowed to fly in June. Um, so I believe your subsequent decision to only display our government flags was so no free expression of the public would be put on display by the city of Santa Paula. And uh, now you've proposed that an amendment would be made to allow the pride progress flag to be in alignment with the county and the state. But um, in my personal opinion, not every decision made by the state and county are very prudent or wise. Um, I believe you need to remain neutral on this issue. And uh, since there, we have over 30,000 people in our community, a lot of with very strong opinions about things, um, this issue and, and people do have very strong opinions about this. Um, I think if we allow the, pro, uh, the pride progress flag, we should allow the pro-life flag. But I think those two flags would probably be considered to be very divisive in our community. People are free, as someone mentioned earlier, to fly whatever flag you would like to flag at your own home or your place of business or in your church. That is an appropriate way 
to express our beliefs because it's done on one's own property and not on government property. So please keep your policy as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg Becker followed by uh, Zachariah Hackins or Hickins, sorry. My name is Greg Becker. I've lived and worked in Santa Paula for 28 plus years. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to voice my comments. I oppose modifying the city's existing flag policy. I think that the proposal to amend the policy is um, promoting a particular political point of view. And I, I don't think it's appropriate for the city to promote a particular political point of view from its public flag polls. So thank you. Thank you. So Zachariah uh, Hawkins, sorry if I got that wrong, followed by uh, John Pauling. Sorry, hard to read. Hello, Mr. Mayor. My name's actually Zachariah Huckins. I'm a school teacher here in Santa Paula. I've been here since 2016. It's my opinion that we should not amend the current flag policy. 30% of Santa Paula, according to recent census data, is Catholic, whereas 0.5%, that is 0.5% of this community, uh, identifies as homosexual, be that lesbian or gay. I think that when you fly this flag from our governmental buildings, you stand in a position of marginalizing a large percent, a large number of your constituency, right, for the benefit of a very small percent of your constituency. And I think that it's the duty of the governmental buildings to represent the folks that they govern, right, and seeing how the majority of the folks that you govern don't identify with this flag, I believe that we should hold our current flag policy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so again, John Pauling, it's hard to read. Hopefully that's close. Followed by uh, Donna <coughs> McClure. Hi, City Council. My name is John Paul Guy. Um, I'll keep it pretty brief. I don't agree with flying the pride flag. Um, I think it's morally wrong to do so. That's all. Thank you. So Donna McClure, followed by Manuel Nijares. Thank you for allowing us to share our opinions tonight. And like everybody else, I appreciate everything that you guys do for our city. I'm a business owner. Uh, my husband and I have lived in Santa Paula for a few years, and we are um, actually we run two businesses, and we're homeowners here. So I basically have two questions and one statement. Um, the first question I have is, I think we would like to know what the city's purpose is for flying these flags. You know, why do you fly the American flag, the California flag, and the other flags? Help us to understand why you do this in the first place. Um, as a taxpayer, I'm just wondering what it's going to take and what it will cost if you decide to change current, the current amendment. You know, can you let us know with all these meetings what this is going to cost, what the flag is going to cost, raising and lowering for 30 days? We, we as taxpayers want to know if this is decided, what of our tax money is going to be spent to do that? A statement. My grandparents came to the U.S. from Mexico in the early 1900s, spent many months in this corridor picking uh, all of the wonderful fruits and vegetables that were um, grown in this valley. We have deep roots in this valley. <clears throat> the city is rich in agriculture, rich in oil, rich in Catholicism with our prestigious Thomas Aquinas College that is known worldwide, rich in the Hispanic culture along with other cultures, I just wonder why the city would feel a need to negate all of those other, uh, all of the other points of interest that this the city is so well known for and has a history for. So negate all of the other things that we're so that that we have that is that we have to offer in this community. Negate all of that to display a, a pride flag. Um, I'm praying that you guys keep the policy as is. Thank you. Thank you. 
Manuel Minjares, followed by uh, Patricia Hierro. Mayor, members of the council, thank you so much for having me, allowing me to speak on this item. Um, I'm here on behalf of Ventura County Supervisor Kelly Long and uh, at the invitation. Um, and uh, what we were invited was to uh, share with the members of the city council the proclamation uh, that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors signed on June 2023, declaring LGBTQ Pride Month in Ventura County for the month of June. Um, you've got to, I'm going to give that to the clerk. Thank you, Julie. You got a difficult decision here, um, and uh, re irregardless of how e any of the council members uh, vote on this item, uh, Supervisor Long looks forward to working with you on the important uh, projects and policy uh, and to collaborate in, in the improvement of uh, the quality of life for Santa Paula residents. And uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, God bless you and your decision making tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Patricia Hierro, followed by Richard Seeley. Hi, thank you for having us, giving us an opportunity to speak. Um, I'm fairly new to the community. I moved here a couple years ago from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, when I first moved to the San Francisco Bay Area, it was quite a tolerant place. I'm a devout Catholic. I had lots of neighbors. People disagreed about lots of things, and we could talk, and we could be kind and charitable. We didn't hate each other, but we could discuss topics. Over the years, especially the last few years before I left that area, it got very divisive. Um, pride flags were flown, but people were marginalized. We could no longer have a dis disagreement with people. It was like if you didn't buy into the agenda the flag represented regarding lifestyle, not about how you treat each other. Um, it was like the dialogue was shut down. We, we, a lot of us felt silenced. And it made me really sad because I used to live in San Francisco and get along with all my neighbors, all my friends, different beliefs. And I really feel like most people have said, everybody can fly their own flags at their businesses, at their homes. But I think the city's governments um, should be a unifying thing, and you should fly the American flag, the state flag, and the city flag, along with the ones that represent the POWs and the, the people who fought for our freedom, for free speech. People have free speech. We're not trying to take that away from anybody, but I'd ask you to really consider um, the effects of amending the current one. If I ask for a flag of Our Lady Guadalupe to be flown all of December because I'm a devout Catholic, and lots of people in Santa Paula would probably love that, I still don't think it would be appropriate because I don't think that's the place of the city government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Seeley, followed by uh, Dominic Richard. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, and concerned citizens. I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you. I grew up in Santa Paula. My parents, Andrew and Lisa Seeley, lived here for th around 30 years and raised their six children here. I have always been proud to be from Santa Paula. I attended St. Augustine Academy off Wells Road from 6th through 12th grade. Every day driving to and from school, I drove past Veterans Memorial Park and saw the Stars and Stripes flying alongside the California state flag, the Santa Paula flag, <clears throat> and the uh, POW and MIA flag. These flags reminded me of my love of my country, my home state, my hometown, and those who fought to keep us free. These flags represent history and values dating back to 1776 and beyond, history and values that all who see the flag share as United States, California, and Santa Paula citizens. I oppose the proposed change of policy because I do not think that the Progress Pride flag represents common history and values, and it in fact represents a movement contrary to that history and those values, and it opposes the unity symbolized by the flags we do currently fly. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Dominic Richard and Richard Ferrier. Hello, Mayor, <clears throat> members of the council. Um, I'm going to keep this short because a lot of the things have already been said. Um, but I just wanted to point out that uh, there's one, I was, I was reading through the amendment, and one of the um, sentences struck me. It said, the city of Santa Paula's flagpoles are not intended to serve as a forum for free expression of the public. Um, but then the amendment goes on to kind of, I think, kind of contradict that by um, allowing the pride flag. 
Um, but I think that that one part is spot on. Um, the amendment will only allow one very specific expression um, of one activist segment of the public. I don't, I don't think that's democratic uh, or representative. And I prefer that um, as a representatives, you don't unilaterally pick and choose which ideologies or expressions um, that will represent this community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Richard uh, Ferrier, followed by Anthony uh, Grumby, Grumbine. My name is Richard Ferrier. I'm a resident of Santa Paula since 1979. Uh, I don't wish to repeat things other people have said. I want to ask uh, a, a question or two and, um, and uh, make what I hope are clarifying remarks. Uh, a flag is not a speech. It is not a piece of writing. It's a symbol. Uh, one of the differences of opinion here is what the symbol represents. Um, now, uh, uh, displaying a flag on your own property um, is a symbol of what you think. Um, for a city to display a symbol on public property is presumably for it to hold up to approval something that the community is united on. Presumably, that's our national flag in the case of our love of our country. Um, I don't know, what made you think that it was even worth considering that we should have a flag which is, um, in, in fact, in experience, if you look at the news, a subject of bitter dispute um, and have it uh, on public property. It doesn't matter for the moment whether it means love and peace and tolerance and kindness or whether it means God hates fags or Lord knows what. People have those opinions um, and, and this, uh, let's call it ambiguous, I think it, well, what do you think the word pride means? What does one have pride in? I was in a political debate once, I've been in politics. Um, and one a person on one side of the argument said that uh, that that uh, that person was for choice, 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 choice. And at one point, I just turned and said, "Choice to do what? <laughs> I'm for choice. You know, I like I like choosing whipping cream at Vons. I like choice. <laughs> um, I like being able to choose what college to send to my my children to. You have to say choose what." Um, it's similarly the case if there's any content to this flag at all that people agree on. It means approval, approbation, affirmation. One is proud of something one holds good or at least tolerably good. <laughs> you're not proud of your faults or, or of your mistakes. Or, you know, you know, are you not a good athlete? Are you proud of being clumsy? No. Um, uh, so we have a symbol. Why in the world would you want to have it at all? And then secondly, um, uh, uh, if it means anything at all, it means some kind of approval. And that's what's sought. The, uh, I'll finish since my time is up. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Grumdon, or I believe, followed by Nick Cepeda. And my wife is here as well, but we'll, we'll be under three minutes, don't worry. Um, thank you, um, Honorable Mayor and uh, City Council members. Uh, thank you for all of your time and effort in this, um, in this discussion. Uh, we have been residents for over 16 years now, I've raised a family here, um, love it here, and um, it's a wonderful town. Um, we are uh, against changing the flag policy for a lot of the reasons mentioned before, um, and sort of just quickly summarizing, we just don't think it's appropriate. This is the government, it stands for city, county, state, um, uh, national, so those are, and, and those for Memorial Park, obviously, veterans, um, so it makes sense that those who are um, that, that is what it's representing. Um, 
and while we're a democracy, and even if the majority were uh, Catholic or whatever, um, as one uh, previous speaker said, uh, we wouldn't believe in uh, flying the Our Lady Guadalupe flag even if 60% of this town was, was Catholic. This is for the city. This is the city's um, emblem. Um, we would make an exception if it was the Rams, not the Raiders, <laughs> um, or the Chargers, which aren't even really an LA team. Um, and so, but aside from that, uh, aside from the Rams and the city's flags, um, we're, we're very strongly uh, in support of you uh, upholding what we currently have. And I just wanted to add too that um, I am also an American citizen that um, immigrated from Canada. So, and I'm really proud to be American and that flag means a lot to me. It's inclusivity. I think it should mean, I think that's one thing I, sh I truly hope that every single person in this room can feel that that is something we can all stand under with pride. Same with our city uh, flag, California flag. This is something that unites us. So I just really ask you to continue to consider that as, as a unification for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Could you say your first name, please, for the record? Yes, Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, Anne thank Marie. you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, Nick Cepeda followed by Wendy Cepeda. Good evening. Uh, councilmen and mayor, councilwomen, thank you for allowing us to speak. I am for the status quo on this policy. I don't think the law would be equal, equally applied. We would, have, we would not have equal treatment under the law by any stretch of the reason if only this particular ideology were allowed the use of the public pulpit of the city's flagpoles. And so I think that would be a bad policy change. I've been in this city for 12 years. I consider it home. I went to college here, and I'm proud of that. And the city has become a beloved place for me. It's so beautiful. It's so American. And the unity I see here in the Little League, in the high school, in, in the things that happen in the town, that to allow something as divisive as this flag, I think would be a tragedy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Cepeda, uh, followed by uh, Ben Coughlin. Hi. I won't, uh, you said not to repeat, so I won't say too much about how I appreciate your work, but I know that meetings are not super fun, and I do appreciate you being willing to hear us all. Um, uh, I do have to say, though, that as a Santa Paula citizen um, and a longtime resident, I'm really profoundly stressed, distressed that I should need to be here at all. The citizens of Santa Paula shouldn't have to show up at a city council meeting to prevent our city flagpole, flagpole from being used to push one particular partisan viewpoint to the exclusion of all other viewpoints. This issue started when the city flew a partisan pride flag then when an application for a Respect Life flag to be shown uh, during Respect Life Month was filed, then and only then, a new policy against partisan flags was made. And now less than two years later, it's being proposed to allow only the pride flag, just one partisan flag gets special treatment. Um, this, this is classic bias. It's classic violation of free speech and it's an entirely inappropriate use of our city flagpole. I, I know and love, very close to, some uh, people with same-sex attraction, and I strongly believe in loving and caring for those who are sexually attracted to the same sex. We don't necessarily choose who we are sexually attracted to, but we do choose how we act on our sexual impulses. The pride at progressive flag is not about being welcoming. It's uh, part of an attempt to strong arm everyone into enthusiastic affirmation of an active LGBTQ, et cetera, lifestyle of a certain way of acting sex sexually. It wants affirmation of that uh, from everyone. This isn't loving tolerance. This is ugly bullying. It's trying to force people to approve lifestyle choices they consider destructive. 
It's not the city's job to pressure its citizens to affirm that it's a good thing for men to have sex with men. It's a good thing to have for, for women to have sex with women. It's a good thing for someone with a penis to demand to be treated like a woman, and it's a good thing for someone to, with a uterus to demand to be treated like a man. That's not the city's job. Um, a flag that demands approvals of those actions does not belong on our city's flagpole. And that's even more the case if all other partisan flags are excluded. That exclusion is a bullying maneuver. Uh, this attempt to avoid honoring free speech while promoting the pet causes of, of um, some in the government is, is, is shocking to me. It doesn't seem to fit in with Santa Paula. Um, the city flagpole is not the place for um, uh, uh, members of our city government to push their own partisan agendas while excluding other viewpoints of Santa Paula citizens. Please do the right thing. Do not change our city policy on the flag. Thank you. Thank you. So Ben Coughlin followed by Benjamin uh, Kieswetter. Thank you, council, council members, and uh, thank you for all the work you do, particularly with the uh, Little League this year. And if you guys decide not to buy the building for $11, I can leave the place. <laughs> uh, my name is Ben Coughlin. Uh, I'm a landscaper, a marine, and I've lived here my whole life. Um, tonight, I asked the city to keep its flag policy unchanged. The flags we raise on our flagpoles should be flags we can all fight for, not flags we fight with each other about. We can fight for America and its flag. We can fight for our state and its flag. And we all want our missing soldiers to come home, but we fight about the other flags. And when we request flags to be flown, they're denied. Uh, to those who think we can just fly our own flags, let me give an example. Two years ago, this council was asked to fly a Respect Life flag for Respect Life Month. My friend, who requested this flag be flown, was at first ignored, and then her persistence got not recognition, but the flag policy we now have. In January of last year, this council voted that policy in, and that policy is just and simple. Now, because of complaints, you are reconsidering the policy. But we knew there would be complaints. Everyone knew that there would be complaints. Those pushing for this change in the policy complain because they don't get special treatment, while we are only asking that there be just treatment under this policy. Two years ago, I saw the flag fly in Veterans Park, and it shocked me because it stands for things I will never agree with, and suddenly I was living under it. Some think that it stands for only including people, no matter who they are, but they are mistaken. We all agree that people deserve respect, but this flag stands for more, and it stands for, among other evil things, the destruction of the family. Many might disagree with me about this, I know many do, but we would also disagree about the Respect Life flag, which I know stands for respecting life, but they think stands for oppressing women. The point is we disagree and fight about these flags. There is no unity or peace in our city under these flags. Two years ago, you wisely looked at many of the flag policies in other towns to learn from them how to write ours. And right now, ours is like many of theirs. Now, a special interest group wants you to change our policy to include the progressive pride flag and exclude all others. Don't decide to implement a radical left-wing flag policy unlike all the others you look to for guidance. It is a trick where they can get the one flag they want without having to include others they don't want by putting the responsibility on the county and state. Look to what they fly, fly it ourselves. I hope you keep peace in our city by keeping our policy unchanged, and let's not have what flags we raise be dictated by what remote governments permit, but raise the flags which stand for all of us as citizens of Santa Paula. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So uh, Barbara Kieswetter followed by uh, Bob Kieswetter. Hi, good evening. My name is Barbara Kieswetter, and I've lived here a long time, uh, about 35 years. And I'm here tonight because I want to go on record as saying I'm very offended that there would be a change in the policy of, fly, of, of having a flag flown that um, is offensive to me, to my family, in the public square, public square. 
We have a pride flag in our neighborhood. Nice neighbors. Um, I've seen several in the city on private property. And I feel entitled to put on my property, express um, at Christmas if I want to have a nativity scene or a personal expression of my beliefs on my property. It's not appropriate in the public square. And I just want to say, I feel n excluded and offended. I, it, it's not honest to say the pride flag is welcoming. It doesn't welcome me. It doesn't include me. So in the public square, unless many special interest groups are, are, are able to fly their flags, then no interest group should be able to fly their flag. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Bob Kieswetter, followed by Christina Eilar. Good evening. Uh, Bob Kieswetter. Um, I'm new in town. Got here 38 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Five kids here. Um, Councilman Chavez, you're really busy. Busy guy. Uh, at the Pride Festival, you told the people there, don't let anyone tell you you shouldn't exist or stay in the shadows. In raising my five kids, if any one of them had said that to anybody, straight, gay, old, young, crippled, autistic, I have autistic grandchildren, it would not go down would not go down. And, uh, Please speak into the microphone. Uh, yeah, Bob, if you could speak in the microphone, please. Uh, you know, I just, I walked up here. I walked. I'm talking to you in language. That's learned behavior. Okay? It's very mysterious what we learn and how we learn it. It's not all in a classroom. Okay? And we're all addressing you. We're looking at you. We're not looking off like this, like maybe if we were autistic. We learn lots of stuff. We don't even understand. We don't understand. Sorry, sorry please. They have the right for their three minutes. We don't understand how we learn. But we're all addressing you because 3,000 people in this town, I'm one. I'm one thirty thousandth. What's that? You guys are one of five. That's a big deal. So we're all looking at you. But don't let positive aspirations of government turn into delusions of grandeur. There's a lot that nobody understands about these problems. And collective action, government action, is not always the solution we imagine it to be. Individual action, there are 350 million people in this country, we've all got problems, all of us, every damn one of us. And mostly, if we solve our problems, we've got to figure it out with ourselves, our family, our friends, the church. Government is pretty remote. It's a fantasy that government has a lot of the answers. Okay? And we're not going to impose unity by flying flags. We've got to realize there's a contrariety of opinion and respect that and live and let live. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Uh, we have Christina Eiler followed by Jean Kermode. Good evening, members of the council, Mayor Sabel. Um, just really quick, I want everyone to take a minute and take a deep breath and realize that a lot of these prejudices are deep down and do erupt at different points in history. We see this with different 
historical marginalized groups that one act, one little change in policy can be a catalyst for a lot of long simmering prejudice and discrimination. I'd like tonight to recognize the progress for LGBTQ plus rights and ask for the council to actively encourage a welcoming and diverse community here in Santa Paula. I have lived here all my life and I'm here advocating for an equitable future in my city, a future that includes ongoing and consistent efforts to resist discrimination and marginalization of any particular population. My brother is getting married next spring to a man. The year he graduated high school, California passed Prop 8, a ban on same-sex marriage. In the time since then, there has been significant progress in legislation and representation. Now he can marry the man he loves. I'm happy for him and very excited for the wedding. People deserve their chance to find love and build their lives without being subject to discrimination or living with harmful stereotypes and defamatory accusations in the shadows. Please, with your role and responsibility as a member of the council, actively advocate for respect of minority groups and diverse voices. The pride progress flag as a rainbow represents the diversity within the LGBTQ plus community and has evolved over the years to accommodate more identities in its banner. The city should emulate the same inclusive mindset and take this as an opportunity to raise the flag as an official statement from the city that recognizes progress for rights and inclusion of diverse identities here in Santa Paula. As is too clearly evident here, progress is sometimes nonlinear. This evening, respect the voices from the LGBTQ plus community sharing their personal experiences of discrimination and marginalization here tonight and act. Re-amend your commitment to the progress of human rights and equality and support the amendment to the policy. Raise the pride flag proudly over Santa Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Jean Kermode followed by Stephen Auclair. Good evening. Um, what I wanted to say has already been said, so I'll just summarize. I believe it would be extremely divisive to fly the particular flag that's in question. And I say that with unconditional love and respect for every member of this community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so Stephen Auclair followed by Kate English. Mr. Mayor, City Council, this is such an important topic to raise as we've discussed for several years now. There's so much misinformation about what the pride flag stands for and who supports it. Earlier, people made broad statements. Things like 30%, somehow they know this percentage, of the city is Catholic and therefore that 30% oppose LGBTQ plus inclusion in the form of a pride flag. Unfortunately, as the uh, term goes or the saying goes, that has unfortunate quality of being inconsistent with facts, right? Polling shows actually 75% of Catholics support LGBTQ plus inclusion. Religious leaders from across this county have stood up and supported the LGB plus, LGBTQ plus community, supported pride flag raisings including Catholic leaders and other leaders, public safety leaders, our own county sheriff, our own county district attorney, our own county fire, have all stood up and supported the rising of the pride flag. To say that this is somehow a partisan issue is counter to even what's happening locally. Earlier, a representative from our esteemed supervisor's office shared that all five county supervisors supported this item. I remind you all that that is a conservative majority board, including our own supervisor in this district, and she has supported it every time. That is not some outlier, that is the direction that we're going, and that is to say that the direction is to save lives. That is what the pride flag is about. In our own county, just a number, uh, actually just over 10 years ago, we had a middle school student that was killed for being LGBTQ plus in this county. Letitia King was considered the worst hate crime towards the LGBTQ plus community since Matthew Shepard, right here in Ventura County. Every day there are those that struggle with suicidal ideation and fear being targeted. 
I fear for my friends in the LGB plus community who just had to listen to a public comment where somebody pointed directly at a member of my community in a raised tone, and one asks, why are you so angry? This is not a partisan issue. This is supported bipartisanship at the bipartisanship level locally. Don't bring national issues in when they don't have to on a partisan level. This is not partisan. Finally, I'll say this is also not a First Amendment issue and that this is not a public square. Some legal counsel would say it is, but that is contrary to every other interpretation that city councils and the county of Ventura has made. Your council has the right to the freedom of speech to display what you support. You have a collective freedom of speech, and that's what this is. This is not a public square. Follow legal counsel across this county. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate English followed by Fabiola Gomez. Hello, Mayor Sobel, city council people. Thank you for hearing all of this today. Oh, another deep breath. Thank you for that uh, message a moment ago. Um, I am Kate English. I use they and she pronouns. Um, I am a, a daughter of a Navy veteran, a Vietnam veteran. I am not a UCLA graduate, but I am a Channel Islands graduate. I, um, when I was a little girl, I knew I was different. I knew that um, no one was grooming me to be queer, um, but I am. And I knew that my friends had crushes on boys and I had crushes on my friends. And, um, you know, this was just who I was. And the first, I didn't understand it, but the first time I heard the word lesbian, um, it was in the same sentence with the word nasty and disgusting. And it was from kids at school. And it was the first time I thought I had a puzzle piece about who I was. And then I immediately learned who I was was not OK. And that flag, my dad taught me to respect that flag. And I do. It stands for freedom of religion, my freedom of speech, although not all speech was always protected, right? LGBTQ members couldn't serve openly in the military. That flag has not always protected LGBTQ plus people. It does not. Um, it was not, it did not make me feel the way I felt the first time I saw a Pride Progress flag raised at a government building, which made me feel like I had arrived at a place where my people and me, we were included, we were safe. Um, you know, I know many LGBTQ plus Republicans. I was raised Catholic. I am a Christ follower. I belong to the Unitarian Universalist Church, and I have lived here in Santa Paula for 23 years, been going to church for that church for 20 years. I'm the board president of the, of the Unitarian Universalist Church. Everyone in my church who would stand up today to support um, this amendment, and I support this amendment. Um, my life is not a lifestyle. I heard that today. My life is my life. My life is not an agenda. It is my life. Um, this flag represents my life. This part of this flag represents trans people who, like so many have mentioned, are in danger, are being um, pushed out of legal spaces, are having their rights taken away all over this country, and there's an organized, funded agenda to do that to them. Um, I'm, uh, I have, <laughs> even though it was a joke, uh, this flag was compared to, uh, somehow all of who I am was compared to like, but it's, it's, you're not okay, but a football flag would be okay. But you're not okay. Um, I encourage you to reconsider amending this policy to completely remove restrictions and then let this board decide what flags it would raise to show inclusion. Let Santa Paula not be the only city that doesn't have this. Please stand up if you're here to support the flag. Thank you. Uh, Fabiola Gomez, uh, followed by Angelica Zidor, I'm not sure. Good evening, Mayor Sobel, council members, and staff, city staff. My name is Fabiola Gomez, and I am a resident here in Santa Paula. And as you may know, I am an organizer with COS. I get to work with youth a lot, and as you may notice <laughs> already, they're not here. They're not present. We had a meeting, and I have something written to say, but we had a meeting on Monday, and I talked to them about this. I was like, let's go and talk about this, right? Um, but they didn't want to. They don't want to be here because they have gotten many comments from our own residents about their sexual orientation. They don't want to hear that today. 
And as I sit here and listen to many comments, I, I'm glad they're not here because they would have listened to so many things that at the end of the day, they could take home and I don't want that for them. But I did listen to amazing comments and I really appreciate that and I really appreciate that support. And that is why I'm here today to ask um, to change the policy for our residents, for our youth, and for, um, yeah, our residents, our youth, and for the allies that, are, that stand next to them. And this flag represents hope for many community members here in Santa Paula and around the world. This flag is a symbol of alliance to the community, and raising the flag is a peaceful and non-harmful act that the city can partake for their residents. The LGBTQ plus community has been a marginalized community and targeted group for many, many decades. So please, reconsider changing the flag policy to show support and alliance. And lastly, I just wanna say most of the flags mentioned before, um, mention they represent opinions and options and beliefs people have. And this is not an opinion, this is not a, a belief. This is something that people live with and are, pr like, are proud of doing that. And you don't have to be part of the community. You can be an ally and you can support them. Um, so thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, Angelica Zidor, and followed by uh, Charlotte Peters. Hi, uh, my name is Angelica Zuniga Duray, and um, so I'm fourth generation Santa Paulan. My grandfather came here in 1908. He bought property that he then sold to the Guadalupe Church so that he can grow its wealth, um, and so. I grew up Catholic. I grew up doing my sacraments at St. Sebastian Church, very influenced by that. And I'm also part of the LGBTQ community. My wife, uh, she works in oncology and she treats cancer. She's good enough to treat any one of these, probably has treated most of these people's families and she works in the public sector. So I, I think that it's very appalling when we're being told that we can't be represented, but we can treat you for cancer. One of the things I wanna bring to light here is that I'm not necessarily going to discuss what the flag represents, but really what I'm gonna discuss is the policy that was chosen um, or utilized to present your arguments and why we can't raise it. Uh, one of the, the things, the issues that I found with the policy that uh, John Cotty had uh, pointed out was that he pointed out f four or five examples of cities that do not match the demographics of Santa Paula. So if we want to recognize Santa Paula, I think I'm a perfect embodiment of that. I'm Hispanic. I've been here for generations. My grandfather was a bracero. He wasn't allowed to buy property until a very late time because of the inherent racism that came out of Santa Paula, which I found really interesting per most of the conversations that were given here were by people who immigrated here 20 years ago. So they don't understand the actual diversity in history and repercussions of what actually happened. The poverty that has come from those Jim Crow era laws that didn't allow people to buy property or only allowed them to live in certain sides of town because that was something that functioned in Santa Paula. I doubt most of these people even recognize that. So I want to bring forward that it's important to recognize that if we don't change the policies that we're implementing, all we're doing is stepping right back into the 50s. What I've acknowledged in tonight's discussion is that I'm two generations younger than the people who are against it, and I'm about a generation older than the people that are for it. And the reason for that is because most of the people that are about my age that went away to college don't live here. They don't live here because there's no opportunities, there's no growth, and this town is stagnant. And to present you some data, some of those cities that were presented in the argument where we said the policy wasn't valid, presented data for Arroyo Grande, for example, um, 
They have a 5.6% poverty rate. Santa Paula has a 17%. The people that are here that are complaining you could, about... You could wrap up your... Uh, wrap up your thoughts in the right. next 10 seconds. The people that are here that are complaining about, um, you know, being represented actually only represent a fraction of the city. It's represented by 77% Hispanic people. So I don't like being represented by individuals that really don't know what they're talking about. Thank you. So thank you for your time. All right. So uh, Charlotte Peters followed by Patricia Savala. Um, hello, so my name is Charlotte Peters, and um, I'm a youth in Santa Paula. I'm 17. I'm a senior in high school. And um, I'm actually here to support the current standing of the policy as it is now. Um, I would like to appreciate um, everybody who's come up here and stated their opinions, because I think it is really educational for all of us to learn. But anyway, um, I wish to make it clear that I do believe in progress. I do believe in diversity, and I love and support all of my friends who are part of the LGBTQIA community. I believe that there are good intentions behind the altering of the policy, but as a city and government, our city and flagpoles should broadcast what a city and government is meant to convey. Although the progressive flag does stand, for, does stand for equality for some, the government and city should simply fly the flags that represent America and all Americans. The American flag represents all of us, all sexualities, all races, and all genders. There are a lot of very strong opinions being here with lots of sides being represented, but the policy as it stands currently allows all communities to, rep to be represented as what we are, because we all are Americans. Um, the, sorry. Furthermore, it shows respect to those who have given their lives for the country. The flag as it stands, the American flag, represents all people 365 days out of the year. The official flagpole of the city does not need a second flag to show a message of community and inclusion, especially because it is such a controversial and, uh, and decisive flag, regardless of what others have said. And unfortunately, that is true. It is very divisive, um, even though it may stand for what other people have said it, stood, it does stand. It is a highly debated and highly argumented subject, and it's very heated. And something like that does not believe on our flagpole, which should represent all of us, all Americans. Also, we should remind ourselves that our city government is meant to be unbiased. Showing any other flag on either side, it could be any other flag, is still showing a partnership to a certain group of people, rather than representing with the people of Santa Paula as a whole of what we are. We are a diverse group of American citizens. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. and. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Patricia Zavala is her last comment. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Patricia Zavala. My pronouns are she, hers, they. Um, we've heard a lot of comments tonight, many repulsive comments that physically make us feel sick. Um, it was a few years ago that I asked for the flag to be flown. It was me, those of you wondering who, what awful person did this, me, a mother. I've seen a, a could, couple of you are, hey, Patricia, could you a couple of you are my um, teachers at my kids' school, which is, uh, but um, that was a beautiful moment when we did that pride flag raising ceremony. Every single one of you shared, and some of you shared some personal experiences about loved ones, and and now we're here. Hopefully you'll amend the policy. I think you all know the right thing to do. I really hope You think back to when we did the flag raising policy and what it meant. And I hope you make the right choice in moving forward and amending the policy to allow the progress pride flag. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, thank you everybody. I want to appreciate everybody listening with uh, uh, respect and sharing your comments. That was uh, uh, to me uh, just a, a emblematic of the kind of city that we have here. All right, so um, everybody okay to start a discussion? You need a quick break? Okay, well, we'll move into a discussion. Council. I'd like to oh, Go ahead. Uh, Councilmember Juarez. Thank you, Mayor. 
Well, first of all, I want to share the mayor's comments about the fact that we truly, I hope I'm speaking for the council, that we truly respect and appreciate all the comments made by everyone here tonight. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to come out and speak, both in support and opposition. <clears throat> I do want to just clarify something that I learned, and, and there was a speaker, and I've also heard people in the community ask this as well. As you know, we're coming up with a new policy on how we agendize items for the council, and this came up because a council member uh, requested it and it was seconded, so then it moved forward. I was a little surprised when I saw the policy that was going to be presented for the agenda and it had the changes already made to it. And my first thought was, well, how much staff time did this take? How much did we pay an attorney to work on it? Or, you know, what effort did it take looking at other policies? So what I learned from the city manager is that actually it, I don't think it costs anything. So would you clarify that? The um, proposal was submitted by council member Chavez. Um, so he, uh, had done the edits that are presented to you tonight. The city attorney, of course, uh, worked on writing the staff report, So, but we are under a retainer, so that counts towards some of the retainer hours we have. So it, it has a cost, but there wasn't a, a significant direct cost to bring and this forward. Thank you, and I appreciate that, Councilmember Chavez. I appreciate you taking the initiative to do that. Um, what I do find a little concerning is that I was the mayor when we raised the flag, and that, and that council was unanimous in support of that, and we did it, and there was no policy. We just, there was a resolution, and we raised the flag. Should we have done it at the, at the War Memorial? Boy, we got a lot of flack for that. Maybe, perhaps, if there had been a, a, a flagpole in front of the city hall like there had been for decades, maybe that would have been maybe a less um, offensive place for, for veterans and, and families of veterans who died. But we did it. And, and then after that, we were faced with, you know, do we continue with this? Because as a, a speaker mentioned, there was a request for then other flags to then come forth. And you talk about, you know, things that have the potential going forward to be divisive. That's when we consulted with Mr. Cotty, the attorney, and he did some research and found that maybe we should come up with a flag policy. The flag policy basically states, as people have read, that we allow the American flag, the California flag, the city of Santa Paula flag, and the MIA POW flag to be flown. And that's pretty much it. Um, I did request if we could to get the policies from around the county. I don't think we got them. But we did, and I hope this is accurate, but we do have a uh, sheet that the city manager gave me about policies. OHI does have a policy where uh, the pride flag and approved commander flags were flown. Moore Park has a, a policy that says US flag, state flag, city flags, are flown. Ventura, no policy. The doesn't have a policy but half flown a pride flag. Oxnard, no policy, doesn't have a policy but half flown a pride flag. And the Philippine flag. Camarillo, no policy. Fillmore, no policy. Thousand Oaks, no policy. Pro Inimi, no policy. And Simi Valley, no policy. So we, in fact, have a policy that is exclusive of a lot of potential flags. But what I kind of see and what I've heard this evening, and maybe other people will agree with me, is that. By the inclusion of the Pride Progress flag, which represents you know, unity and inclusion, but at the same time, the way it's written is exclusive and therefore divisive. And that's, I think, what it's doing today. You know, somebody mentioned maybe we should have a flag policy that, you know, go back to the original where all flags are excluded except those four, or include every of them. Well, I think at this point, if we did, in fact, uh, stay with the same policy, you know, other cities have had a resolution where they raise flag uh, there have been comments about maybe not raising it on a pole, but maybe somewhere else. There's other ways to, um, to uh, celebrate, you know, people. And um, I've said this before, and I said it, and some council members here said it at that pride raising uh, ceremony, but, you know, I have friends and family that are of the LGBTQ plus community. And they're friends and they're family, and I love them all, and I respect them, and, and so that's where I'm at at this moment. And for the moment, that's my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Chavez. Absolutely. Um, well, first and foremost, I just want to, for the record, notate that the state of California, the county of Ventura, raised a pride flag every June. And this year, the city of Port Wainimi, by vote of the council, raised their flag. I'm going to ask my colleagues to consider having an open mind 
as we navigate on the issue that requires a little bit of understanding on how one segment of our population has been marginalized and the harm it has caused to their lives. This is where the, the dialogue and, and the storytelling and understanding each other, our humanity, where we come from. And I feel that that didn't take place when this policy was enacted last year. I saw the videos. I saw there was no dialogue with the people who this would impact. And as a new council member that represents a marginalized community, it's important for us to have dialogue for and against. I'm going to put into context because it's important to understand where we're coming from. What binds us as human beings? So I'm going to share a little bit of history so that I hope that folks and my colleagues can comprehend what the struggle has been all about. We all know that in 2021, Mayor Juarez at the time and council raised a flag. That was a historic moment in time for the city. There were many people that were there present. Some of them share those photos with me. Some of, some of them shared their experience. And in the following year, a policy to not raise it. So now you've given people hope. You snatched it away. And that's why I'm bringing this up. Because it's important, again, to understand context, understand our role in society, understand how government works and its layers, county, state, federal, the three branches of government. And it's been over 100 years of a struggle of people like myself and others who had to grow up in a society that told them it was not OK to be who you are that created laws. And I'm going to name some of these laws, because imagine growing up as a young person. The year before I graduated, Matthew Ch Shepard died. That was a poignant moment in our history for a young youth to die the way he did. It led to a national conversation. There's been laws that have hurt people's lives. What are some of those laws? Let's see. Their basic existence. Oh, you can be a Boy Scout. I was a Boy Scout, oh my god. The world wasn't coming to an end. But growing up in an environment where you can't be yourself, it isn't a choice. What is a choice is how you come out. And imagine growing up in a household, in a family that is not embracing of who you are. So you have to keep that dirty little secret all your life until you get your freedom and you determine, you know what, this is who I am. A lot of young people go through that. Hasn't gotten better? Absolutely, it's gotten better. Are we there yet? No, we're not, unfortunately. We've been denied equal protection under the law. We've been denied the freedom to marry who we love. We've been denied the ability to serve openly in the military. We have been denied protections against discrimination. Just for who you are, you could get fired. Done, gone. Why do you think we couldn't work in certain industries? Because we couldn't contain ourselves, right? At some point, we come to a reconciliation of who we are. And everyone has to reconcile that with themselves when they look in the mirror and they wake up. Many of my gay, lesbian brothers and sisters, my bisexual brothers and sisters, my transgender brothers and sisters, have had an individual struggle because they grew up in an era that was, it wasn't acceptable. We live today where your young person grows up, and you know what? It is acceptable. However, you have to be in the a certain kind of household, right? Because if your religious beliefs tells you, no, you can't be gay, then guess what? That person's just going to not be who they are. And what does that do to your mental state? 
what does that do to the kind of life that you want to live? What kind of unfulfilled dreams do many young people that are LGBT are never going to be able to reach them because they get into destructive behavior, unhealthy behavior, because they don't have the self-worth. They didn't receive the love at home. They had to find it somewhere else. So when we talk about raising this flag, we're talking about the symbol of a struggle of over 100 years. And what I'm asking is for people to have compassion for one another. It doesn't take anything away from you, does it? Does that flag take anything away from you? It uplifts those that are struggling. It uplifts those that need it. You haven't been denied discrimination. You haven't been attacked. You have not been uh, had homo homophobic slurs against you. But people in our community, in my community, have. And I'm asking you, as my colleagues, to understand that struggle. To the people who have religious conviction, at the end of the day, we live one life. And if you can't be your authentic self, then I'm sorry that you were too much into what scripture taught you. But humanity is what binds us. And that's why I'm asking for there to be consideration for this. It really doesn't hurt anybody. It actually saves lives. I've talked to so many young people who say, oh my God, I'm so proud to see someone that I can look up to because I didn't have that growing up. So it's positive, it's uplifting because we want people to live healthy, positive relationships, have those things in their lives. But when we live in a society that has done so much damage through laws, in the courthouse, we've had a fight for those rights. Now we're coming to a turning point, which happened in 2003, where the United States Supreme Court reversed Lawrence v. Texas. That eroded same sex, the ability for us to have same sex marriage. Think about all the love that took place when that got eroded. The relationships, the aspirations, at the end of the day, don't we all wanna be happy? Find someone that loves us, live in a society that we can care for one another and each other as good neighbors? That's why I put this forward. That's why I wrote it. Because you've taken something away that the community, you gave to the community, Mayor Juarez. And our community is changing and there's only one constant that, that, we, that exists and that's change. So we can either embrace the change or we can live in the past. I ask my fellow Santa Paulans to join hands with each other. If it doesn't affect you, don't look at it, right? How many things, what world do we live in? You don't like it on social media, just flip it. Don't, don't like it, just, just ignore it. It's not hurting you. Um, I'm gonna end with, with my last point here. And you know, I, I feel like I've been walking and I've been carrying this weight and walking on eggshells because it takes me back to my youth, having to hide who I was. My dream was to go to the US military. I did military programs for nine years. And when they passed a the law, don't ask, don't tell, guess what? Oh, what am I gonna do, I can't be myself? That was stolen from me. That was harmful to people like me who wanted to serve. I have neighbors that aren't here today that serve in the US military. Actually, two same-sex couples that live in Harvest that serve in the US military proudly because things change, policies change. And I asked my colleagues today to be allies of action and to stand on the right side of history and justice. Sometimes it's not always popular but you know what? You can, always, you can never change everybody's mind, right? But I know that deep inside, good people care for each other. That's the beauty of this town. We'll pass this. By raising that flag, you will empower a group of people, but it's not gonna do any harm to you, I promise you. Um, think about what your vote says today. 
taking a position of neutral, neutral, neutrality, excuse me, is not the way. Let's be in sync with the state of California and the county of Ventura, the three layers of government who already have raised their flag each June, one month, 30 days. Empathy and compassion towards those who have suffered in the pursuit of accepting their authentic self. Well, that's, that is the way. So raising the pride flag, like I mentioned before, is about saving lives and does no harm. I know each of, one, of us has experiences in our own families. I lost my uncle who couldn't be himself because he wasn't accepted. He grew up in a Catholic household. So I'm doing this not only for all of us now, but for those we've lost who couldn't achieve their full potential because they lived in an era where society was not accepting of them. Thank you everybody for <laughs> Thank you everybody for being here. Even uh, if you don't agree with what's being said, the fact that you voiced your concern and you're here shows that you care about the issue and it's about maybe each of us learning something new and finding common ground. So I appreciate that from everybody who's in here who took the time out of their day on a Wednesday. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll leave my comments there. Thank you for that last statement. Uh, Vice Mayor Cornejo. Thank you. Um, I think you're a real asset to our council to bring issues like this forward. And you're a true example to the community for what you do and what you've overcome. I believe that what you do is far more important than putting up a flag that it would be perceived as unfair because there are other people who have flags that are equally as meaningful to them. And that's the difficulty that we struggled with a year and a half ago was how to be fair to our community. We, we suddenly were receiving requests for other flags to be flown and we were going to either have to deny them or fly them all. At this, and at this point, to be fair, you fly them all. And then it, it all gets muddled, people's causes, keep people's beliefs, and the, the, the hard work, the distraction that is caused to our staff who are trying to make this city work, it's, it, it would have put too much of a burden on them. And this is why we struggled deeply with this and decided that the most fair thing to do for our community was to make sure that we had government flags that everybody stands under. It's a very difficult situation. I just believe that in our own lives, um, and again, people have heard my stories. Um, I had um, a gay uncle who was mugged in San Francisco for being gay, and he nearly lost his eyesight. I was his favorite niece, I think. I did my best to make sure that he was loved and cared for. And I think that that, and he was a libertarian and really didn't care for government, messing with his life and doing this kind of stuff. It was the one-on-one -on -one things that make a difference. And you being here, and not only one-on-one, -on -one, but one-on-one -on -one to our to entire community, so people can see what can, how you can be respected here in this position um, and, and being openly gay and being an, an incredible and thoughtful fellow council person. Um, in my own life, I have many gay clients. They come to me because I treat them as an equal, because I'm fair with them, because I don't treat them like anybody else. I treat them as well as I can, as well as I can treat anybody else that comes in my door. Um, I lost in a former work, I lost five colleagues in the 80s to AIDS. I know suffering. I saw agony. I saw how people suffered in that community. And I see how much better it has gotten. And those that who, who survived 
and were actually friends of and um, close to those that we lost, I support their businesses. And I, and I think that's how we can individually do better. I just think at this point, as we discussed with so much thought and difficulty, how hard it was to figure out how we can support and yet be fair to everyone with the diversity of opinions. And I, I don't care if you're 30% or one person, your opinion matters. And that's why sitting here listening to everybody, I love every second of it. With every opinion, I want to know how everybody feels. And I think we can all serve everyone better by understanding everyone's concerns, their pain, what their needs are. Um, but opening the door with the flag is so difficult because then it, it gets muddled and everyone wants a flag. And we have to accommodate that. As a government, we have to be fair. Legally, we can be sued. We need to be fair to everybody. So, it's, uh, so this is why we honed down our policy to the government flags. Um, and that was the decision before. And I, I, it's a painful decision for me. And I respect um, the concerns and the needs. But I, I think we need to keep the policy as it was. It was very well thought out. It wasn't a let's just do this kind of thing. We discussed it a lot and we suffered a lot over the decision. And I think it just makes it difficult in the future for us to um, function with the staff that we have to start accommodating all the different flags and finding a way to, to find that balance and fairness for everyone that has an opinion. And, um, and I know however we vote today, um, not everyone is going to support however the vote is. And that's very difficult for all of us and my fellow colleagues. And I'm just um, very regretful for that. Um, but I know that every one of us cares. And everyone in this room cares about this city regardless. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Cross, right? I have a question uh, for city attorney. I can call you city attorney now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you speak, I mean, I know you weren't here when we had this conversation last time. Can you speak to your understanding of Boston and the, well, maybe start there. Instead of giving you a two-part part question. So, uh, yes, uh, Council Member uh, Crosswhite, I believe you're referring to the 20. 22 Supreme Court decision out of uh, city of Boston. Um, in that decision, the Supreme Court <coughs> ruled that the city's rejection of a Christian flag on a city flag pole was a violation of the First Amendment's uh, free speech clause. Um, in that instance, it's, it was distinguishable to what the city has done here because Boston did not have a policy in place. The one they did have was very bare bones and simply required that the um, requester, who could be from anybody in the public, um, say that they're holding an event near the flagpole and the event has a flag it wants to fly. And so the first time a Christian flag was requested because of an event that was being held nearby, um, was proposed to the council, that was rejected. The Supreme Court said this was impermissible under the First Amendment because it was, there was no establishment that the city um, did to show that the flagpole was a non-public forum. And what that means is um, the city has the right to say that no, this is not an area of free expression. What this is instead is an area of government speech. So that speaks, that's about uh, something called uh, uh, government speech doctrine. And once a city establishes a policy, they're allowed to speak for themselves to represent its own values, and it can decide what or what not to put up on its um, flagpoles or other public facilities. Um, what it cannot do is say 
in a public forum, this free speech cannot be stated. This person cannot say this point of view. Um, so, for example, city council could not pass a law that says you cannot wave the pride progress flag on the sidewalk because that's a public forum, what's traditionally used for public speech. Um, but when it comes to city property and you have a written policy that describes what the city wishes to support, that is defensible government speech. Okay, so then the, the follow-up to that is if, I'm trying to think how to word my question. Um, so does there have to be a process for determining if the city were going to fly flags other than those that are currently in the policy, does there have to then be a policy for establishing that? Or like, because the, the policy that's before us sets that the, it, it, one flag is just added, right? So then with the Boston decision, how would that relate to, would there have to be then a process if you were flying something other than the currently authorized flags? Right, so, so it really works on a spectrum. If we were to adopt the amended policy as presented, it does make an exception just for the Pride Progress flag. And that is something the city council can do but it's going to open it more to attack because it is so um, partial to one point of view. And my opinion is that it could be defensible in court, but I don't know if that's a risk the council would wanna take. Um, there is also an ability to um, not name any sort of flag and expand what is allowed, but it has to be even, it has to be equal to reduce the chance of, of any sort of challenge. So can you clarify that last piece? So by saying that it has to be equal, are you meaning that there, the different flags would have equal opportunity to be considered? Correct. You can, there are different models. So there are um, some cities that will allow for members of the public to make a request. Um, that is a little more leaning to the side of, of non-government speech because you're giving the impression that a private citizen is dictating what the government is expressing. Um, or what's more defensible is a policy that allows a council member um, to motion for a certain flag to be raised and then that's voted upon by the rest of the body. So that would be uh, more apparent to a reasonable observer that that is coming from the government body and not a private person. Thank you. I don't know if there's anyone else who has questions on that in particular. Okay. Any further comments? Uh, Vice Mayor? <coughs> Um, in thinking of the flag that we do have, to which we pledge allegiance before all of our meetings, um, we know what every stripe and every star means. Um, it's not ambiguous, a pride flag, you know, you can look it up, there are all different descriptions of what each of those colors means. Um, it's been changed several times. I know the Progress Pride is the one that's being um, promoted for this, um, but I just think that a flag that we stand by and pledge to and finish saying, and justice for all, is the best flag that we can have standing on our government. I know we don't always measure up to that. I know there isn't always justice for all. I think conversations like this make it better for everybody because we understand people's challenges and their needs and we need to address them. Um, but I'm not certain that a flag, which will open us up to other flags and other causes, um, 
maybe lesser importance, maybe more important, um, is, is an awful lot for a small city to handle. And I think if we, we, we have laws of non-discrimination, we need to make sure that we're held to that by our hiring practices, by our inclusionary practices of everything that we do in our city. Um, um, I think that's better where our energies should lay um, rather than giving our staff more work to do in determining this flag, not that flag, and that sort of thing. So um, I just, uh, and again, maybe it's easy for me to say because I'm not gay, but I've lived very close to people who are and um, have suffered with them and have understood their, their challenges and their needs and have done everything that I can to support them. And I, I just think that um, our city, as much as we all love our city and love each other, I, I'm not sure this is going to make it easy for everybody. Um, so I'm, I, I, would, I would hope that we maintain the existing policy. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Juarez. Thank you, Mayor. You know, I, I certainly don't believe that the gentleman that spoke and, you know, talked about a sports flag meant any disrespect to anybody. It's very difficult to get up and speak in public and maybe adding some levity. But on a serious note, just recently, and I don't remember where I heard it, I believe Councilmember Crosswhite may have told me about the conflict that's going on in another country. Somebody raised a flag in support of the people that are being victimized. And then somebody right away said, well, we want to raise our flag for the other side. You know, where does it end? Where, where you know, when you support somebody, uh, somebody's going to be the opposition. And I certainly don't want to get into a divisive flagpole wars with, you know, defending one entity one day and next month another. And I mean, we don't need that, uh, that divisiveness. I mean, it's been pretty calm this last year by having just those flags that we fly. Um, and as I said before, I think there's other ways that we can celebrate, you know, the diversity that we have in our city and our country. Um, maybe not on the flag, on the flagpole. Thank you. Thank you, Member Council Member Council Member Chavez. There was uh, somebody who mentioned the importance of facts, right? Uh, we had a national discourse and a debate going on in this country. It's been U.S. Supreme Court, our legislature, our, our Congress. They've enacted support. They cemented marriage equality. It's gone to the, the president has signed, the state of California, the county of Ventura. We have all levels of government. Why, why, why do you think that is? Because they're trying to embrace the mistakes that have been done in the past by using the law to go against people who are, happen to be LGBT. The country has embraced this. It's happened at all levels of government. All we're asking for us to be in sync with those three levels of government. Because that sends a strong message of unity that we've struggled with to obtain. I will say one thing, and I know sometimes it could be difficult. You might have your own personal religious convictions, and I respect that. Sometimes it's best when you do have those convictions to abstain. And no, there's, that's, that's purely okay. Because if you're struggling with it that much, that's even more, it demonstrates the reason why that flag still should go up. Because the dialogue isn't, hasn't ended. We're still in the struggle and we're still in the fight. And I hope that we can win hearts and minds and also respect personal religious views. But if you have and you have that and you're struggling with that, just abstain. That's what the abstention's for. Thank you. Councilmember Crosswhite. So I have a question for uh, Councilmember Chavez. So my understanding of what the city attorney has said is that the, the draft policy as it is presented here could potentially be defensible but could also be challenging because there isn't a process for allowing consideration of other flags. So what if, if, if 
what process would you propose for considering which flags are um, considered government speech? So the law itself, when, the, when they enacted the whole debate about public versus government, it's my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, what we're saying as a council is that this issue outweighs, we're not a cause, we're not a, uh, we're picking a choice. This is a group of people who have been marginalized that live in our community. And so th this council by making its decision, by adding that as one of the flags is taking a stand that the majority of every level of government has supported in this country. Now, if we're saying that we want to consider other flags, well, that's, that's a separate thing. What we're saying, what we're arguing today is the pride flag. Because if we're going to go that route, what I would say is that the council, because it's the expression of the will of the council to bring up if they would like another flag raised. And I don't have a problem with the council member, because we're elected, to bring up a flag if they so want to. There should be a process for that if you want to create that as a process, as part of reviewing the amendment, right? To strengthen the existing policy so that we don't eliminate litigation if that ever comes to it, right? So I would say I would be open uh, Council Member Crosswhite, if, if, if the council, any council member can bring up, and yeah, we should have a discussion. We should have a discussion, why not? That's a healthy thing. And yes, it might be tough, but you know what? That's our job, to have, the more we talk to each other, the more we get community involved, the better the outcome. I'm sure there's people on both sides that are gonna walk away with a little nugget of knowledge that maybe they didn't realize. So I'd be open to working with having the, the uh, attorney here include some language that a council member, because it's the expression of government speech, not public speech. And that's the, separate, the real separation legally when it comes to the argument. And you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, uh, that's correct in, in concept, yes. You can um, adopt a policy as written, but again, it is the most vulnerable to challenge and you to um, bolster the city's defenses, you would want to, at the very least, include a process where only council members can um, decide and propose any sort of flag, not just the pride progress flag, but any flag, any cause that the council then decides as a on majority vote will represent the values or the sentiments of the city. There may be times where that's warranted. We don't know what's happening in the future. We need to leave it, leave it open for this council and future councils to make that determination. And yes, it's hard to make tough decisions, but that's what we're here for. Vice Mayor. Um, <coughs> I still think that our staff time is better spent working on the things that we ask them to do, which is <clears throat> create an economic environment that gives people jobs so that they can better their lives, that we give them good streets that they can drive on, that um, we, get, we do safe crosswalks, and that's for everybody. Everybody in the city benefits from that. And I, I'm just afraid that the perception of the um, proposed flag could create some division into our city that I, I just don't want us to set, go down that path and I don't want to go down the path of having to be approached by people for this flag and that flag and this cause and that cause. Um, I, I just, I, I just, I'm a practical person and I'm trying to keep it so that our city can function and do the job that they have to do 
for everyone. And I don't believe anyone in our city or anyone that works for our city is prejudiced, is bigoted, and that they're there to serve. I'm talking about this, our city employees over whom we have a control. That um, I don't believe that they, um, I believe that they're doing everything they can to better our community. And that's everyone. Seniors, um, poor, um, disabled, um, you know, there isn't, we don't have enough stripes to do a flag for everybody that's in need and everybody that we care for. So, and, and actually, I don't, I don't know if we need to spend the time on this or not, but can anyone tell me what each color of the proposed flag stands for? I don't know by memory, I can talk, read it to you. Okay. Of all, of Council Member Chavez looking at Council Member Juarez. Thank you. Excuse me, Council Member Chavez. Um, if I'm hearing our new uh, city attorney correctly, yes, if we adopt this policy the way it is, then the Pride Progress flag gets precedence over all other flags. And any other flag that may be suggested by a current or future council member is then up, then up to a majority of the vote to, to make it happen. And there again, you might run into the problem where if you get a divisive council or thoughts of, different thoughts of opinion, what if that flag raising fails? Then you got a lawsuit. Whereas the other one already has precedence to go up each year during June. And I just think that sets a bad, bad precedence. Thank you. Just the clarity, I mean, probably we would have a policy in order to have a conversation on having a flag and not outlining a specific flag. Yes, yeah, so what I had uh, tried to explain earlier was that you have the option, if you were to adopt the amendments as is, that is the most vulnerable to attack um, that uh, the uh, city would face, although it would likely be upheld, and I'm thinking of an earlier case decision um, upheld by the uh, Supreme Court um, where a city uh, refused to accept a donation of a permanent monument in a city park um, for a minority group, but then it did accept the donation of a Ten Commandments permanent monument. And the reason why that was upheld as a constitutional uh, rejection and a form of government speech was because this permanent uh, Ten Commandments monument was something that the city had decided is one of the values it wants to uphold. Um, and and I, th I think of this situation here is similar in that the city can deny other flags while still appearing to favor the pride progress flag. And that would be upheld as long as it's government speech. But I do think that's going to invite more legal attention and challenge. And it, the city would probably face um, possible defense expenses to that. Conversely, you have the second option of in incorporating a process that would be more defensible where a council member proposes a flag and we other cities call it a commemorative flag. So it doesn't name which flag. It just is some flag that is affiliated with a cause or an occasion um, similar to the proclamations that we have. Um, and somebody would propose that and then council decides, is this by majority vote something that our city wants to promote or stand by? So this, it's two separate ideas of a policy. Thank you for that. Council Member Chavez. Just, uh, 
to let uh, Council Member Cornejo know about the, mm -hmm. the representation of the colors. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple symbolize life, healing, sunlight, nature, art, and serenity, while the p white, pink, and blue stripes represent uh, tr people that are trans, uh, transgender. The black and brown stripes represent marginalized LGBTQ people of color, as well as those living with HIV AIDS. Thank you. <clears throat> so it doesn't include everybody. It's only include, it is a flag for marginalized persons. So it is excluding others in our community. So, I mean, that's just by, by the nature of that argument, when you have those certain people that you are advocating for, you are excluding those that are not included on the flag. I think you missed the whole discussion I mentioned about the struggle yeah. that well, I, marginalized people have gone through. And I've lived with them and I've cared for them. And um, I just don't want anything flying above city officially that doesn't represent and make everyone understood in the city that it is a statement for everyone in our city. And I, and I don't want to exclude anyone. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, well, I'll jump in a little bit here. So I appreciate uh, several folks said that how uh, difficult this might be for us up here, and I hope you can understand that. Um, so, yeah, when we raised the flag, thank you, uh, then Mayor Juarez, that was a beautiful moment. If anybody was there, it was a very powerful and profound moment. Um, it meant a lot to us, and it meant to a lot of the community that was there, and it did change some people's lives that day. So there's just no doubt that, that the flag is, you know, one, welcoming, but two, transform, transformative. Somebody had mentioned symbols. It is a symbol. So it means a lot to a lot of people. Um, and then when we had the discussion about the first go around to have the flag policy, I felt very incomplete that day because we didn't have this conversation that we had here today. So again, I appreciate everybody coming out and uh, having the courage, as Council Member Juarez said, to stand up and at the podium and uh, share things that were difficult to share in public. Um, so, so I feel much better that we've had this solid conversation. And I don't know if you have ever served on a jury before, but I've been there where one second you're like guilty and the second you're innocent. You know, all the arguments have been very compelling. So I appreciate that. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, some of the stuff that was said tonight and uh, we received lots of emails. I haven't looked at the ones today, but in the last few days, been a ton of emails coming in and uh, just a lot of very eloquent and well-argued uh, points and details, so I appreciate that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of steal some quotes uh, that kind of encompass everything. So one was allowing the Pride Progress flag to be flown alongside our national and state flags during June sends a powerful message of solidarity, acceptance, and support of the LGBTQ plus community shows that our city is committed to creating an environment where all residents can feel safe, welcome, and celebrated. Um, then another person sent in where they met with a bunch of youth and had youth kind of share um, and you know what it means to be part of a community and be acknowledged as a community. You're never alone. Uh, there are people supporting and walking with you. Uh, we support everybody's opinion since we're human. Do not stop until you accomplish your goal, we'll be there with you. Um, we'll be together. So um, we've come a long way and I appreciate the history that, that uh, Council Member Chavez shared, even to be, have, be able to get, have this conversation in this room. This couldn't happen uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So, um, but also um, as, as been shared by some of my colleagues, 
Um, oh boy. Well, the uh, this idea. Uh, um, well, for me, you know, um, it was very hard to read. They added just the one flag into the list of four flags that we had on there. So conceptually, it sounded great. I seconded it because I wouldn't have this conversation. I believe uh, that raising the flag is a great thing. At the same time, it was very, very difficult to me to see one flag placed in the other flag. So I'm not sure if I use the, count, the, the idea of fairness, but it just is, um, yeah, it's just very hard for me to reconcile that. So, um, so that makes me very uncomfortable. And a, a couple of years ago, I was more interested in maybe having a process where we could have a discussion about that. But however, four years ago, Again, to, you know, it was a tough, tough decision back then, and I wasn't sure um, if we're doing the right thing. But I voted with everybody because I do understand uh, that this is not something I want to be doing every meeting. So, if every meeting we're having a thing where, if we had a process where council can suggest a flag, and we're having this conversation, have different people come in, then. Um, I'm kind of stickler for city business. As the vice mayor mentioned, we do a lot of things for the community that are part of our core responsibilities that we can't not do. And uh, we've been having a lot of discussions lately about having more crisp meetings so that more people attend. So if I, I am very uncomfortable getting into or uh, cementing a process where we're going to be having these conversations all the time, even though this is the civil rights thing it's a you know carries deep meaning for everybody and I understand that but um, I'm not uh, um, I don't think the, the city council level especially for our town is the place where we're having those conversations I think there's ways we need to have those conversations and I appreciate it but I'm not sure this is the place to do it but if it's not evident that I'm torn I'm very torn on this thank you any other comments for Councilmember Crossway? I think that Boston made this a harder conversation because I think one thing that we all agree on is that we want all of the members of our community to feel welcomed and accepted, and that's the LGBTQ community, it's the autistic community, it's the um, you know the members of our community with disabilities or who have different racial and cultural backgrounds and all of those things, and we you know different religious beliefs, different political views. Like we want everyone to feel like they're a welcome, accepted part of this community. Part of what the, the question that we have is, is, is there a, is there a value in us standing up for people who haven't been able to traditionally stand up for themselves? And so, Part of the, the challenge that we have to wrestle with is if that's something that as individuals who sit here, if that's something that we're willing to do. We did it once, then Boston happened, it made it trickier. The question is, how do we now, post Boston decision, how do we navigate that? And I know that we've heard various opinions on both sides of that issue. And I know that one of the things that we struggled with before was, you know, could you get into a position where 
someday in the future, if the makeup of the council changed, you were ending up with these conversations once a month where you were having lots of members of the community coming out. And I know that we struggled with that. And there's a, there's a struggle by nature of saying, we want to include everyone. Are we doing that if we don't say that we do? And what does it look like for us to say that we do? So just something, again, as we're talking about this and we're wrestling with this, it's something to, to wrestle with and struggle with, right? If no one had ever said anything, most of those of us up here would not be able to be married to the people that we're married to. So it, it, it's, a, it's this, this challenge that we're in, right? Because, and, and this is a nonpartisan office and this should be a nonpartisan issue. How do we treat our neighbor? And what does it look like for us to care for our neighbor? And I think that we, the, the, if we were gonna move forward, we need to move forward with having a conversation about a process for what that looks like. To, and, and maybe that's when you have a request, maybe there's some requests that would need to be a special meeting so that it has space apart from the regular meetings so that we could still make sure that the regular business was happening. Maybe it happens on you know, the Wednesdays we wouldn't normally have a meeting or on a Tuesday or something. I don't know, right? We could have a conversation about what a process would look like if the council wanted to consider a process for being able to make sure that we had space to have those conversations. And there could come a day when there starts to become a, a rhythm and we know what that looks like and we know what to expect. I don't know, thoughts? I think that's where our legal counsel comes into play to maybe create some language that strengthens what the process would look like I know that the state of California and the League of Cities, the LGBT caucus is working on creating some draft templates that can be used for cities that wanna go and make sure that they uh, acknowledge the struggle and the, the fight for civil rights and social justice for LGBTQ people. So there's stuff that's gonna be coming down, but I think at the end of the day, we have to make tough choices. And there's, you, you know in your gut feeling what's right and what's wrong. And sometimes you're not gonna appease everybody. That's not, that's not what we're, we're here to appease everybody. Sometimes you have to take a stand because you actually nailed something on the head. A lot of us <laughs> wouldn't have the relationships we had, have, if it wasn't for a fight and a struggle. And we sometimes have to take a stand on these issues. And it is the will of the council. It's not public speech. And the law, all Boston did was basically say, gave us two choices. Create ordinances that define basically, you know, what your um, government speech is versus what is public speech. And so I like to recommend that uh, our council, Castillo, look into maybe strengthening language or looking into some, some language that can, can talk about process and, and bring that issue back. To, for consideration, but I think at the end of the day, we do have to take a stand and not just be an ally, say you're an ally by not doing the action. And that's a tough call sometimes, I get it. Sometimes some people are not gonna be, are gonna be upset with you for not doing what they think is best. But take a stand, if you have that experience, that personal experience of struggle that you have in your own lives with people who are gay and lesbian, 
Stand up for them. Vice Mayor. There are many ways I can stand up for them and many ways that I can support their businesses and care for them on a personal basis. Um, so I, I just feel that sometimes that's a stronger message and has a greater effect than, than the flag. And because the flag opens us up to all of a sudden muddling it with many other requests, and then it's going to lose the value that it had. Uh, and so I, I'm just, I'm, I worry about setting us off on that path um, some of our options tonight are to decline to move forward on this item and I would ask that we at least decline on this particular item because of the issues that have been brought up by our city attorney. Um, I'm, I'm not opposed to conversations on future conversations on how we move forward with recognizing um, uh, social issues and social challenges in our city. I think we deal with them all the time. Look what we've done for spirit. Look what we've done for um, uh, finding housing. We, we've done, we try very hard with our limited resources to do what we can. And, and those are concrete things that give people jobs, that give people a, a place to live. And I think many, in many ways, that's how we can help them best. Um, I, I don't want to just talk. Um, so I, I, my, I would just ask that we not proceed with this item this evening. I don't mind asking that we pursue other ways of, um, other processes for, for us to decide if that's practical for us or not in the future. Councilmember Chavez. For a matter of procedure, a matter of time, you know, this is what democracy is about, having conversation. And so as part of the process, so folks understand what can take place at this moment in time is I will make a motion, someone will either second it or not, and if there is no second, then the motion dies and then we can figure this out at a later point. But for the record, let's be sure about where people stand. A point of order, Mayor. It almost sounds, it, it almost sounded like Vice Mayor Cornejo summarized that as a motion, just didn't say it. So if that was a motion, if you would state it, if not, then. Okay, then I would state that as a motion that we um, decline to move forward with this item at this particular time, and that we request that staff conduct further review of flag display policies um, based, considering, especially since the changed law, since our last policy was made. And I would second that, Mayor. Councilmember Crossway. So, for clarification, <laughs> does that mean that what you're saying we don't move forward is the resolution as it's redlined in here? Correct. But that we would be looking at a, what a process would look like for determining if we would fly flags in the future. For example, the council member process or what other cities might do to, I just wanna make sure that I understand the motion. Right, that is, that is the motion. Um, and again, I think we're talking about commemorative flags, which is um, a legal status for that along the lines of resolutions and proclamations and that sort of thing, to just to see what is practical for our city um, in the future. Um, but I'm, as presented the resolution, I, that I'm asking that we, I move that we decline to move forward on the resolution and ask that staff conduct a review of the flag display policies. Um, so it's actually, 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 sorry, asking for both. We're given this option or the other. Um, can that be a combined motion? So Vice Mayor Cornejo, um, first there's no resolution presented to you tonight. Okay. Um, the, the, so on the item, the, the item, not the resolution. So the motion is not to move forward with the amendments with an adopting motion, with an adopting resolution at a future time. Correct, and thank you for that correction yeah, on the but verbiage. Then to direct staff to research other policies and a process for commemorative flags. Commemorative flags or public um, public speech, not public speech, the government, government speech. speech, government speech. Other forms of. Government, government speech. speech, yes. Okay. 
Yeah. So one thing to make clear is that other forms of government speech could be like the example I gave earlier of a of, a, of erecting monuments. Mm -hmm. um, and so is that something that Yes, we said, I don't about? think it should, we should just be talking about flags. I think yeah. we should just, just generally be discussing flags. those types of issues. Okay. All right. Does that, is that clear now? Are you all right with that? So research as a into second? policies that uh, approve commemorative flags. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Councilmember Crossway. And, and I would second that amended motion. Okay, so the motion on the table now Sorry. is that we are looking into a process for what it would look like to be able to approve commemorative flags. Does not just does not have to be just flags. If you're talking about monuments or anything else, it should be a more general policy. Mr. Mayor, I would just point out that we do have a policy on uh, recognition. So the council has at its current disposal the opportunity to do proclamations, uh, months, like you did with Pride Month, uh, days, recognizing individuals and recognizing organizations, in addition to anything else you want to consider. Thank you. So, um, so therefore, I would stand by that motion, but the intent is that we just look into that same policy that we have and, and see if, there is, if it should be expanded to, to flags. Does that make sense? I know I'm going all over the place, but I'm just That's trying to. <laughs> it's a complicated issue, I understand. Um, so, the amend so the motion is do not move forward with the proposed amendments. Correct to be adopted by resolution, but direct staff to look into ways of expanding our current recognition and proclamations policy to include flags. That sounds good to me. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> yeah. You know, right tonight we're discussing a flag policy. Now we're trying to combine it with our or other policy, and that, that may get a little muddled. And for mm -hmm. Boston, for example, I believe would be talking about flag policy. Well, flag and monuments, possibly, but not proper. Boston was only about flags. Oh, right. So okay. I'm not sure okay. we want to tie the two together. Councilman Crossway? Yeah, I th this is feeling a little muddy trying to wade into the proclamation policy and the flag policy, which are two mm -hmm. currently different um, policies. So I'm... Would it be best to go the other way that I mentioned, which was, if I make a motion, it isn't second in the size, but it's for the record. You mean for, for what's written tonight? Sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what the, it's on the agenda. About adding other stuff to it. Would that be advice instead? Mayor. So that we can move forward. Council Member Horace. Or in the second portion of Vice Mayor's motion to separate the two to make them clear that one is a monument and one is to revisit um, anything having to do with the flag policy. So, it's, so they're not muddled together. Because I think it's a good motion. I think it's a good way to move forward and then uh, address two issues, two subjects on two different levels. Okay. Um, I can I can withdraw my motion if you want to make the motion on that item, and then we'll continue with the. Okay. I'm going to withdraw th that motion um, with the desire of Council Member um, Chavez to make his motion. All right. So the Vice Mayor has withdrawn her motion. Uh, I also withdraw my second mayor. Okay. Thank you very much. So then we're uh, back to. Uh, the recommendation staff recommends that the city council discuss amending the flag display policy and if amendments are requested direct staff to return with an adopting resolution at a future meeting so um 
now we're looking for a motion, and then I will say if there is a second, then we go to a vote. A yes would be to amend, and no would be to not amend. Councilmember Chavez. So I motion that the city council direct the city attorney to make recommendations for amending the flag display policy. Motion by Chavez. Is there a second? Can I ask for a question of clarification on the motion? Please. Is that, when you say recommended changes, does that include a process? No. Yeah, it's written. So I have clear direction. Um, it's the motion for the city attorney to bring back an amended policy that in some form could allow for the pride progress flag. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay, the part of, that says it's with the return of adopting resolution at a future meeting, so. But it would be as like, it would be accepting the red line just going for the straight decision on what's in the in the packet now. The, motion, so, the initial recommendation is for us to basically... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. getting text messages that nobody can hear. Oh, yeah. So um, the motion basically is based on what the, what the recommendation here is, is that we direct amending the policy, right, for you to uh, come back with an adopting resolution at a future meeting. Correct. Yeah, so the motion is to make the amendments proposed tonight. Correct. In a resolution to be brought back at the at a future meeting. Right. Correct. So okay. So that's the motion, and then. So we have a motion by Chavez. Do we have a second? I think enough time has transpired, so we don't have a second. So the motion doesn't carry. So, Councilmember Cross. So my question for you, Councilmember Chavez, is if you would consider dir us directing the city attorney to come back with, I don't know if it's a, a version of the resolution or with a process by which um, commemorative flags could be considered. Well, it's more like a future agenda item. Actually, yes, that would be. And that, so I would not make that motion because I... I would not make that motion because I agree. It sounds like something I would need to work on for a future agenda item through our new process. I think. Is that true? Well, it's not enacted yet. Well, except that what we were looking at was a process by which what it was before us could be considered. And the challenge that I heard from city attorney was that without a process, you put yourself in sort of tenuous legal ground. Well, but I think we, by not having a vote, we've decided that we are not going with the amendment, but there is a suggestion to have a conversation about developing a process, which I believe is a separate conversation, which would be a future agenda item. So the motion has died. Right. And so council can later, anyone among you can then request this be a future agenda item. And I appreciate that, and then, and it would, it would allow us to have that discussion, which would be great. All right. Um, well, thank you to my colleagues. I know that was tough. I appreciate everything. I appreciate everybody here. I'm going to go ahead and call a seven-minute break because. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome back everybody. Appreciate the time and the break and the late evening. I kind of mumbled, but I just wanted to
make this official. Is there any regular public comment? No, Mayor, I don't have any regular public comments. Thank you. All right, so we'll be moving on to item seven, presentations. Tonight we have one presentation, 7A, Community and Economic Development Department report, April through September 2023. This is uh, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just really quickly, really quickly, the um, one thing I wanted to kind of high level, is it work? Yes, it should oh. be. High level um, shift that's happened, if you hadn't heard, um, we've really had challenges, as you know, um, just in the recruitment process, um, people dropping out, people not showing up for interviews over the last few years coming out of COVID. I'm not sure there's a lot of speculation on what the dynamic is that's going on of why, but I really don't care at this point. We're getting lots of candidates and we're getting lots of opportunities and we're getting really good people. So um, we've got, uh, for planning, we've got uh, management analyst for housing, uh, assistant planner, associate planner, community development technician. Those are all positions that are open that we'll be interviewing between now and February for. Um, and then building and safety, uh, we just, uh, did interviews both uh, uh, Director Barnes and I uh, for administrative analysts for both of our departments. We had nine candidates and I would say five of them were excellent candidates that could actually be useful in other departments. So that's exciting. So um, just moving along. Um, pretty much all the numbers are pretty consistent where we've been as far as active projects, weekly inspections and all those type of things. Uh, code cases are about the same. One thing that's happening, um, we still don't have a code uh, inspector, but uh, our chief building official and our, our permit tech who's uh, certified for code have been responding to either complaints or input from uh, community or council. So we've been able to, uh, we've kind of stayed at the, about the same number of code cases which isn't really reflective of the probably 30 or 40 or so that we've had over that time that have been closed out. So there's a lot of movement. It just, uh, um, it's not real clear that way. Um, let's get through this. Um, had a lot of commission meetings, uh, planning commission meetings. We went through several uh, adopted uh, new uh, codes. Um, we had, um, D's Thai Cuisine got their alcohol permit, um, and we also uh, did the, um, both the council and the planning commission, the uh, small scale alcohol permit. So that, um, and then we also met twice with the um, Housing and Homeless Committee and had some robust conversations, both about Spirit and their funding earlier um, in this quarter, and uh, talked at, um, about the continuum of care, homeless services, uh, the housing authority, and what their roles and opportunities are. And we had some really good discussions about uh, rent control and tenant and landlord rights and how we can reach out to the community and, and start to have some discussions about uh, information and education within the community. Um, industrial development, pretty much everything we talked about in the last quarter is still in process. Uh, sometimes developments like watching uh, grass grow, but um, it's uh, Bender Industrial has their pr plans in now. Um, one thing that's really important about that project, um, the developer was going to do everything himself on that project. He decided as a tilt up concrete building, he was going to bring in someone that can do that. When I talked to him four months ago, he, I asked him how long I was going to do the building. He said probably about three or four years. And, and so now he's like, well, I got somebody in, it's going to be a regular development time. So, so it'll probably be 18 months to two years. It'll be completely done. So that, that was exciting. Um, everything else up there is moving along. I think probably the most important thing on that page um, are, is really Santa Paula West Business Park. We're going to planning commission um, next week. We'll be coming to council in November and we'll be engaging with LAFCO uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, with staff with LAFCO and hopefully coming to the LAFCO board right after that if they, there's no more surprises. So we're excited about that. A lot of activity in Le along Lemonwood. Uh, Benpack has uh, 
put up all their buildings for sale. They're looking at moving. They haven't decided where they can go. They can't find a place yet. But uh, that provides some good opportunities for us. Um, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity in the sense that uh, if we can do some focus on actual more employment in that corridor and less warehousing, that could be a really good opportunity for Santa Paula. Um, Sorry, question. <coughs> I'm bleary a little bit, so I might get this wrong. So for the business park, the, West, the Santa Paula West Business Park, it's gone repeatedly to LAFCO, right? And then I'm getting no over here. And now it's coming to council, and then it goes back to LAFCO. So I'm not so, quite sure of the process so there. It will go to the Planning Commission. What we, what we had is we had some changes that LAFCO through the Watershed uh, Protection District uh, required. Those were made to the plan, which required an amendment to the EIR. So that addendum to the EIR will go to Planning Commission, then to Council. The specific plan has all been approved. Everything about it's been approved is just this, this nuance. And since it's only addendum, it's a it's very low level change. As long as LAFCO staff is okay with that, we'll go to LAFCO board for annexation and that'll be a project that we'll be able to, to build soon after. Thank you. Um, exciting times for us downtown and throughout the city. I, I think uh, if we can just keep these restaurants coming in and get, getting them open, uh, we have a good opportunity to create a strong restaurant district for Santa Paula. Um, also, East Area Gateway. Um, we just re-engaged on the, um, the medical offices. I'm still waiting for the county supervisors to vote on budget for the medical, for the actual hospital. So uh, it seems like every couple months they push it off another month. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, McGaelic Finch property, that is the uh, retail property at Halleck in 126. Um, they have dropped off conceptual plans for that. I think we'll be re you'll be really excited to see that. We'll share with those with you soon. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, before the end of the year, they'll announce their tenants. So at, at least their anchor tenants and some of their restaurants. Their goal is to be open um, probably mid to late 2025 to have that whole center open. So that's, that's exciting. Um, and that's really all those projects. One is Red Tail, uh, 298 apartments. Two is what a two that tri little small triangle. Another piece is 113,000 square foot retail center. Four will also be retail, probably hotel. Three, I will be coming back to you with some uh, concepts and ideas for interim use on that. And five is the medical office and medical center, potentially a community college district. Real quick question: That little parcel between one and two, that little triangle. I mean, is there any plans for that? It almost looks like the little house on up. Uh, little house in the prairie. That 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 is um, uh, Ward Trucking. I've talked to them, and um, our hope is to get Santa Paula West Business Park um, going by the time those other two things start going and they'll have an opportunity. They're ready to move. They know that they're gonna to need to move at some point. We'd love to keep them in the city and they wanna stay in the city. So we're hoping we can make something work for them. But I don't know what would go in there ultimately, probably more retail. Um, uh, showed you this before, a couple of things have shifted a little bit, but I think what's important is to look at uh, the bottom numbers, which is you know total proposed units uh, 689, total proposed affordable units 319. That's really exciting when we talk about things, um, especially when we're talking about availability of affordable housing. When it's affordable and it's affordable deed restricted, that means we will have affordable housing in perpetuity in those categories, which that's that's pretty exciting. Vice Mayor, a just a quick question: How? How close does that get to us to our numbers for the arena numbers? Um, for low, low, 100%. For low, we're in the 40% to 50% range. That's just with these right here. Okay. And there's more coming down the pipeline. Great. So, I mean, we have an eight-year cycle. We'll probably hit it within four years. Great. Thank you. Um, as you know, we um, 
are in the process, we're in escrow right now on this half acre parcel at Harvard and Maine. Um, we purchased it, well, we will be purchasing it with affordable housing trust fund money, which can only be used for acquisition development, financial support, or refurbishment of affordable housing. So the way we're looking at this is um, something that's important. There's, there's two sides to this um, piece of property. One is there could be opportunity to leverage additional transitional housing that could help out uh, spirit and potentially be have families on that site to get children out of the con congregate care in the shelter. In addition, there's other needs we have as far as tr transitional housing. Um, if we can make a project work on there initially, it would be something uh, transitional, as I mentioned, uh, pods or tiny homes that could be moved and, and a, so another project could be done on the site. If it doesn't turn out to be viable based on size and ability to do a permanent project, we would probably look at leveraging this property either in sale or swap to get something um, more viable. So we have no long-term plans at this point. But one thing we do know is eventually we're going to have improvements to both Main Street and Harvard. That could be three years. It could be 10 years. But that means we'd have to acquire a right-of-way. And owning the property, that saves us a significant amount of money not have to deal with that because this is a, an odd shape. But more importantly, as you well know, this is a dangerous intersection. And it provides us opportunity also to potentially do a roundabout or do some traffic control in owning all of that. So that will, there's a lot of things we can leverage on this that will be helpful and create health and safety for the community, whether in housing or in traffic control. Um, wanted to put this up again because we probably get um, at least one or two inquiries a week from somebody, usually people doing marketing or trying to figure out what's going on in the city. And just referring them to our website um, is really helpful. And thank you, uh, Councilmember Chavez, for uh, kind of prompting us to check the numbers and what we had in there and getting it updated. But in any event, uh, it's, it's really helpful. You click on any one of those numbers, it'll tell you the project. And there's uh, elevations of those projects. So uh, please, if you're at home looking at this, uh, Give it a shot. It'll give you uh, all that's going on within the city right now. Uh, housing development, East Area 1, um, we're just kind of working through things. Phase 1 is all units are sold. There's one house left uh, to get its CFO. Um, and uh, Phase 1D, uh, tentative maps are approved. P we're expecting plan submittal by the end of the month, and that's the uh, former school site. And initial project is uh, Lennar uh, wrapping all the way around that site, still looking to sell the in interior units. Phase two is the uh, Foothill neighborhood. And uh, tentative maps have been approved. Designs are underway. Um, we just have a lot of <coughs> structure to work with between infrastructure, fire safety, and uh, the development agreement as we move forward to figure out all these pieces go together. The linchpin in all of this is clearly the bridge. The bridge is really important to the health and safety of, of that community and uh, ingress and egress. Um, um, I put at the very bottom that asterisk next to phase 1D. Um, we got to have a contract with the Ventura C County Community Development Corporation to manage our public benefit housing program. Right when we got all that together, got all the builders together and did a, um, uh, basically a tutorial on how they can promote that as a part of their project. Uh, the rest of the builders pulled out and interest rates went up to 7%. So that <laughs> it, it just nipped it. And now all the homes are sold. So actually next week they're gonna start uh, uh, working with uh, Lewis on uh, phase 1D um, and basically bringing up the sales agents uh, up to what uh, that project is, the public benefit housing, which is $25,000 down payment assistance for first-time home buyers that are public employees. And that's any uh, government, public agency, hospital, uh, school district. Right. So what would be the time frame, do we think? For the- For 1D. 1D, um, probably going into construction uh, um, first quarter next year, February, March. And you mentioned the bridge, so 
when's the estimated completion date, which seems to be? Pro well, here, here's, uh, the, in all likelihood, their window is March through September next year to do construction. So, you know, fingers crossed, crossed that there isn't, you know, some catastrophic flood event um, that would put it um, probably mid 2025 or early 2025 for the bridge to be done. So that's that's what we're hoping. You know, every hope stars align, we can get there because they just have that window of dry creek bread to do what they need to do. Um, I'm gonna move through this real quickly. Um, yeah, I just I looked at this these numbers and please don't look at that. <laughs> but that's yeah, it's uh, an 86 percent reduction in what we had from last year to this year. That's just really rough, but there's still all the stuff that we had that's in the pipeline, and so we're just trying to push that through um, before the end of this fiscal year because it's really important to our budget. Um, economic development. Um, I mentioned Lemonwood. There's a lot of vacancies, a lot of things moving around in there. I am talking to brokers and businesses every week. It seems like I'm meeting with somebody. Can you can you get out to Lemonwood? Can you get out to Ben Pack? Can you get out to Action Pack? You know, today and we've got some people that want to talk to the city. So there's a lot of there's uh, about a one and a half to two percent vacancy of industrial property in Ventura County and given that we have somewhere around 180 to 200,000 square feet of vacant industrial building space right now and another 73,000 square feet coming online in the next two years, it's people are looking at Santa Paula. We just need to be poised to get them in. Um, downtown business activities, the, probably the biggest thing in the last four months has been getting ready for this Jubilee. It's just trying to figure out how we get that together. So this Saturday is the big day. And uh, we collaborate with city manager's office and the fellows on uh, business roundtables, uh, looking to do a broker's roundtable in November. I've been, uh, all these folks have been talking to in Lemonwood and others and trying to get them all aligned up to get them here to have a conversation. And uh, just other activities. Um, we're gonna try again for the homeless encampment resolution grant. Um, that's what we tried to do when we were looking to work on the Triangle site or the uh, Santa Paula Motel site again, and that's coming back around again uh, this fall, well, actually at the end of this year. Um, and as you well know, uh, we went through uh, quite a bit of discussion and iterations on the funding for Spirit uh, and getting that worked out with the county and Fillmore. So that was quite a bit of time uh, this last few, few months. Um, Santa Paula Affordable Housing Task Force has been really helpful with our housing element we are on getting ready to submit the fifth round and we're going to set up a phone call in the next two weeks with uh, uh, affordable housing developers that are on the affordable housing task force to have them on the call with HCD and talk about if we don't have an approved housing element they can't get projects done they can't get the funding and that they are a group in this community that advocates for affordable housing and they support Santa Paula, they support our housing element, and they support the way that we work with the community, which is in contrast to a lot of cities in, this, in the Skag region. And it's, for us to not have a housing element right now is just incomprehensible, but anyway. Um, several, several of you are at the uh, conference today. Uh, there was a forum in uh, May also, um, a smaller, uh, forum for housing opportunities made easier um, talking about affordable housing opportunities within Ventura County and finally uh, CityGate uh, some of you had interviews with CityGate they done did a pretty good job of reaching out to I had a lot of businesses call me after they talked to them and said I was kind of candid and I said stuff is it okay that I <laughs> I threw you under the bus I'm like have at it we need to find out how to be better at what we do uh, Hunt is doing a city wayfinding program. Uh, three weeks ago, they did a tour of the city, and uh, we're going to be meeting um, at the end of the month to go through their findings and some of their preliminary ideas as far as locations and uh, style for signage and um, kind of the, the graphic design. Uh, Placer AI um, was working with uh, 
uh, Jonathan, the city manager's office, on identifying specific geofencing we want to use for Saturday's events so we can think about where did people come from that came to all the different things that happened around downtown, um, both as restaurants and locations, the uh, whole railroad area and the park. So we'll have some inf interesting information in two weeks about who came to Santa Paula, where they came from, and uh, where they spent their time and money. So that should be really helpful. Um, and city property negotiations, uh, we got the fire station, as you can see, is up and uh, getting ready to get done. Uh, we have uh, some FICO surplus, surplus, surplus property where there were um, the uh, eucalyptus trees along Steckel that we're going to be working with them on that. Uh, Union oil property, we talked about that tonight. Um, all of these were a part of us getting title and appraisal. So the last on that list is actually the first on that list. I talked to you several months ago about uh, selling two small um, properties on Palm Avenue. So we'll be hopefully disposing of them before the end of the year. So that'll be some good revenue to have in. And then also city facility assistance on uh, permit coordination for city hall improvements and other facility improvements just through building and safety. Um, I put that already. That is all. Any questions? Be glad to. Council, uh, Councilman Crosswhite. Super quick. So, <clears throat> when do we think we might have a sense of when our housing element is going to get approved? We have really quickly. Their last comments were they gave us a matrix that said we are we you didn't address these four item and items in your housing element and that was it and it was you didn't talk about trail systems you didn't talk about safe routes to school you didn't talk about your parks and you didn't talk about just one other thing yeah yeah and what it was was all these things are clear in our general plan they are not a part of, part of a housing element uh, they never have been a part of a housing element they just kind of threw that in there and said you need to address this it's like well it's in our general plan do you want us to put it in the housing element they didn't give us any clarity on that so that's our call with them with the affordable housing task force to go and if um, long answer but this will be our fifth submittal but before we submit we want to get clarification that we have everything and want them to look us in the eye and nod and go we're not going to throw some new stuff at you because every time they've given us every other housing element that's been approved in the county has we have things that they've required us to do that none of them were required to do. And it's, <laughs> but, but what do you, and, and what it comes down to is there are more, uh, there's more pressure from special interests than there is from cities at this point. So there's really two options we have if we get held up. And that's either uh, League of Cities and see who else is out there that's having challenges and coming together on something, or working with our state legislators to have a conversation with HCD. But so that's that's where we'll be if this conversation doesn't right. go forward. So after that, we might have to have a conversation about, because this is drug on way too long, and it's a counter to the goal of the housing element. So yeah. thanks. And from a staff perspective, the amount of time that this takes from us doing what we need to do, because we're just circling the drain. Anyway, thank you. Right. All right. Thanks very much for the presentation, as always. Great stuff. All right. We'll move on to item eight, city council reports. Um, I'll start on the right with council member Chavez. Um, I, I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As folks know, I always do a report at the second meeting of every month. Since we didn't meet in September, my report is from August 16th through October 18th. I provided it to the city clerk for recording in the record, and um, I'll leave it at that. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and then we were dark, and then I missed one, so I have, but I'll just run through quickly what uh, I have done since last meeting. I uh, met with, for a regular coffee that I have with Caitlin Berenger, who is president of the chamber currently and works with Food Share. 
Uh, that was September 11th. On the 13th, I attended the PBID meeting and the Ad Hoc Harvest Development Agreement meeting. On the September 14th, met with the group, the group from Chevron, uh, with the mayor and staff and city manager, uh, with the archivists before they went over to look at the, uh, to sort assets and log those. On the 19th, a special study, study session of city council. 21st, met with Rondi Guthrie of Athens. And on the 25th, I met with uh, POA President Dan McCarthy and two other officers regarding some of their concerns about the department. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Crosswhite. All right, uh, a couple of things. Uh, the Southern California Association of Governments Economic Summit is on December 7th, so I plan to go down. If anyone else plans to go down, let me know. Um, hopefully there can be some carpooling. Um, one of the things that happened at the last meeting, there, if I don't know if people noticed uh, this morning, those of us, you who were at the Ventura County um, Housing Conference, there were some of us there, um, they announced that the farm worker housing study had gotten funding by SCAG. Um, so that was one of the things we got to approve at the last meeting was that farm worker housing study um, got almost half a million dollars um, so that it can do all of the work that it needs to do. Um, there also, it, we, we were informed that their governor did an executive order um, that is uh, directing the insurance commissioner to try to help stabilize um, insurance companies and bring some back into the market. So we'll see what effect that has, um, but the executive order is hoping um, to help that situation. Uh, just this weekend, I was talking to someone who was moving from one rental to another and being told by their insurance company that even their renter's insurance couldn't get renewed. And so they were scrambling to try to find renter's insurance because um, it was required by the place they were moving into. Um, at our clean power alliance meeting, we have approved, so far as it depends on us, uh, Port Wainimi uh, joining. So now it is dependent upon two things. Um, one is there was there's a resource adequacy deadline for the end of October. We'll see how that goes. And then it also is dependent upon um, the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, because um, as you remember, there was some question around whether or not they were going to still approve our application. There were some other cities um, in other um, clean power alliances, I can't think, uh, community choice aggregators, I think is what they call them officially, um, around the, the state that hadn't gotten theirs approved. Um, we had a very nice letter from our senator and some other senators in the area that um, we think helped um, in getting our application approval. Um, so we'll see when what their timeline is going to end up being, um, but they were approved to move forward. It's just a question of how long that will take, um, and that remains to be seen. Um, so at the Ventura County Transportation Commission meeting, um, we voted to move forward with phase one of the consolidation plan, um, but not to move forward immediately with phase two, um, but to study what uh, partial consolidation would look like. The official, it, it wasn't entirely clear when they came and met with us um, that the partial consolidation for phase two uh, was suggesting that our city would have been combined with Gold Coast Transit District. Uh, and so, the, there will be much more conversation before any, you know, financial analysis, options, alternatives that are looked at. Um, the, one of the recommendations was to potentially move forward with straight with, with uh, phase two, and that was not um, the direction that the board went at the last meeting. Um, in terms of uh, the bridge uh, along the railroad tracks, not our bridge, but that bridge, um, it is gonna have a similar construction timeline for the very same reasons that we just heard about from Mr. Mason. Um, original hope was to have it done by the end of this year or early next year, and then they looked at rain and flooding and all of those lovely things and went, oh wait, we can't construct a bridge in the middle of winter. So it will be starting, um, and they hope to have it done 
uh, by the end of summer, early fall of next year. Um, let's see. Uh, just for everyone's edification, we are running a little bit over budget on the our transit system in the Santa, the Heritage Valley. A lot of that has to do with a, a jump in dial a ride that wasn't planned for. Um, however, there are other funds uh, that VCTC is looking at to supplement that so that that wouldn't come back on Santa Paula and Fillmore. Um, but just a uh, a little update there, and they're looking at some efficiencies because part of what happened was ridership went up and efficiency went down um, due to scheduling. So they're working on trying to improve that so people can still get a ride when they can't want one, but um, it'll be hopefully a little bit more efficient so it's not costing us. I think right now the worst case scenario is that we could be over budget by 300,000. So um, they're working on some solutions to that and trying to understand why. Is it a temporary bump? Is it going to be sustained? Um, the housing conference this morning was great, and I think that's my update for now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Juarez. Thank you, Mayor. Every month on the first Thursday of the month is a senior advisor committee. They did meet this month. They are one member short. They're still advertising for a a fifth member, they are proposing a name change for the community center, and I think those are going to be uh, in discussions at the uh, department, department uh, director level, and then they might come to us. And next month they're supposed to, I think, and I saw the agenda, they're supposed to come and give a presentation to the council, the senior advisory committee. Um, I, I was at the uh, Santa Paula Beautiful on Saturday, September 7th, as was Councilmember Chavez, and I think I saw the city manager there, too, picking up... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, and Mayor Sabell. Uh, yeah, so we made the park look uh, very nice for the upcoming sesquicentennial. I'll talk about that in a minute. I did attend Bruce Dickinson's memorial, which uh, culminated with a flyover of several planes on Saturday, September 7th. Uh, we all attended a special council meeting on the 7th as well at 3 p.m. I had the opportunity to assist uh, Chief Aguilar with the Ventura County Leadership Academy on the 12th. They uh, visit different cities and learn about different uh, aspects of our government. And the chief gave him the tour, and he gave me eight minutes to talk about 110 minutes of history. And I did, and I did achieve that in eight minutes. That's my record. Um, but uh, a highlight of this week was today uh, we were invited to go to uh, the high school. They had an invitation to visit and meet with uh, United States Army Brigadier General Ida T. Boras. She's the highest ranking female Hispanic in the United States Army. She came all the way from the Pentagon and she was very inspirational to the students. They had it in the uh, McMahon gym. And uh, of course, you know, the, the students asked questions about being in the Army, but two questions that stuck out to me was they asked her what was one of the hardest things for her to do. Well, first was of course, you know, going into the Army against her family's wishes. Second was being a female in the Army. So that, and now she's risen from a reservist to a Brigadier General. When somebody asked her to describe the duties of a, of a, I think, what was it, um, a general, she said, well, I, I, I think I'd be better off to tell you what I believe are the responsibilities and duties of a soldier, which everybody in the military is a soldier, even me, I'm a soldier, and my duty is that I will be willing to lay down my life so that you can have freedom and have freedom to make decisions. But I only ask one thing, she said, make good decisions. So it was very inspirational, and I mean, the crowd was silent listening to her. So anyway, that was great. I do want to end with, uh, there is the sesquicentennial celebration Saturday, culminating here, the 150th anniversary of the County of Ventura. A lot going on in the railroad corridor with the Yale, I'm sorry, Santa Barbara Street with several booths, things going on at the, the Ag Museum, and, uh, and of course culminating at the park with uh, uh, five bands performing. That's uh, going to be very, very neat. And, uh, the Historical Society has been tasked with uh, doing a walking tour, so we'll be hosting a self-guided walking tour, and uh, the, I'll just name the nine locations. Starting from 11 to 3, every 15 minutes, the, uh, the San Paul Theater Center, the Universalist Unitarian Church, the Odd Fellows Clock Tower, the Oil Museum, which is going to be open so people can walk in, the San Paul Art Museum, the Warning, the uh, St. Francis Dam uh, Monument, the Santa Paula Railroad Depot, the Santa Paula Police Memorial, and the Santa Paula Farm Workers Monument. So and that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. And there are still tickets available for the concert, so get them while they last. All right. Um, I attended the uh, Ventura County Planning Commission via Zoom about the uh, 
the first meeting with the Planning Commission on the potential disadvantaged community designation. I had to drop off, so I don't know where that ended up. Uh, the Cycle Calcos uh, remote meeting, so a couple great presentations. Um, uh, several of us were at the Taste of Santa Paula, second annual, and that was uh, just great. So I think that's going to become an annual, so that would be great. Um, I also was at the Bruce Dickinson Memorial. There must have been 300 people there, and just eloquent uh, testimonies is really a beautiful event. Uh, also, there's a, a Councilmember Chavez and I were at the UU fundraiser for the De Colores, uh, presented by the Marasa family thing, which is always fantastic. Um, several of us met with the uh, search team for the uh, our police chief recruitment, John Lewis. Um, and then I attended the community forum for the thing. It was a great discussion, although we need some more folks if we do it again. Um, housing conference, as was mentioned, which is really great. And what was kind of fun is uh, Mr. Lewis was the keynote speaker, and he must have mentioned Santa Paula 20 times. And then other p folks mentioned Santa Paula. So Santa Paula was, <laughs> it was like this, you know, as Mr. Aguirre likes to call us the center of the universe, we were the center of the universe today, so it was really fun. And then uh, I, I, I made a quick appearance at the Women's Economic Venture event uh, in Camarillo, which is beautiful, but unfortunately we had our session, so I had to come back. But, um, and I, I, I don't know exactly, but they honored two different recipients for awards that are from Santa Paula. So Santa Paula was, and they got one for Ventura County, one from for Santa Barbara County somehow. So it was a great event, and they're a great organization, so they love Santa Paula. All right, so. Lunch today. Thank you very much. Well, I missed that part. And so then we had lunch um, with a, an invitation from Jan Marholan at the Boys and Girls Club. So the city manager and I were there and along with Supervisor Long, and then uh, Richard Yao from the uh, Dean? CS. CSS. Channel Islands, yeah. And uh, yeah, a lovely conversation, and we had lunch together, and, um, and had just a lot of great ideas on how we can get our youth kind of integrated with all sorts of different things. So uh, there's a lot of great stuff came out of that. Thank you for the reminder. All right, it is 1031, so would we like to proceed? I move we extend the meeting beyond 10.30. Okay. I'll second. All right, we have motion by Juarez, second by Cornejo. Thanks, you. So we'll move ahead. City Manager. I'll skip my report and let you move on. All right. Um, okay, so we'll move on to item 10, the consent calendar. The background information has been provided to the City Council on all matters listed under the consent calendar, and these items are considered to be routine by the City Council and are normally approved by one motion. If discussion is requested by a council member on any item or a member of the public wishes to comment on an item, that item may be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Are there any council members who'd like to remove an uh, item from the consent calendar? I'm seeing no, all right. Um, Make a motion. Is there any direct questions on a particular item? No? Okay, we have a motion. Councilmember Chavez. I'll second. I make a motion to accept the <laughs> consent calendar. We have a motion by Chavez and a preemptory second by Crosswhite. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, you have a question? Just one thing. Okay. I do need to abstain from the minutes of the meetings that I was not here in October 4th and 9th. Thank you very much. All right. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody against? Say nay. Motion carries five to zero. All right. We will move on to, we got some speed actions. Uh, action items. Uh, we've already covered items 11A and 11B earlier, so we'll be moving on to 11C with our very patient finance director, Ms. Ramirez. Go for it. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, so I have good news and bad, for you, bad news for you. The bad news is that um, I will be the rest of your agenda. Both items will be mine. Um, the good news is that they'll be relatively short in comparison because at least one of these items will be um, coming back to you at the next council meeting, and that is the uh, fiscal year in review. You may have noticed that our staff report um, was very informational, and this will be uh, more so informational, um, but the uh, ending fund balances and 
um, recommendations by line item um, will be brought back to you on November 1st, at which time you'll also be hearing the uh, recommendations from the Measure T Committee on any uh, uh, items uh, that will be dealt with uh, with a surplus from Measure T funds. So let's start off with the year-end review for general fund revenues and expenditures. The very brief, brief story is that as is uh, unexpected news because we've told you quarterly revenues uh, did not materialize as we had hoped that they would with the original budget and amended budget. Um, that being said, uh, uh, the council took a very conservative approach. Um, there was a lot of staff vacancies that remained vacant um, and there uh, is not expected to be a shortfall in uh, your fund balance at this uh, time. Not all the carryovers may be approved because there may not be enough money that is uh, available, but there will not be a shortfall. So let's start off with a focus on uh, the revenues by category. This data, this information was in the staff report and we'll get into the specifics um, in the uh, coming slides. You'll notice that the total budget variance is uh, about 95% of budgeted amount to uh, our actuals, um, while 95% is passing and, and very doable in any other situation, that does uh, constitute about a million dollar shortfall um, in the uh, expected uh, activity, the expected budget to actual activity that occurred. Um, the other item that you'll recall is that this is all of your general fund, uh, all of your general funds, including the sub funds, specifically Measure T. Measure T has, uh, has a surplus uh, projected. Um, and their revenues did come in over uh, expectations, so that dips further in. So you'll see that in a second. So starting off with the specifics of the general fund revenue detail, um, for charges for services, it's a big number. It's $1.3 million. Plan checks, which were budgeted at 569000 which itself was a already decreased from the original budget, actually came in at 391000 Inspection fees, which were budgeted at 140,000, came in at around 100,000. The school resource officer was budgeted at 263,000. Uh, we did recognize uh, 222,000, uh, almost 223,000 in uh, anticipated uh, uh, payment from the school uh, in, in regards to the billing related to school resource officer. However, because there were some true ups, there was a credit of 35,000 from the prior year. Uh, so the Difference is uh, about 80,000 uh, compared to the budgeted amount. The summer school program was budgeted at 415,000, but the uh, revenues did not yet materialize. The expenses did not yet materialize. You'll notice in the staff report, the Parks and Recreation Department is um, severely, uh, their, their actuals did not meet their budget. That's primarily because their expenses did not occur yet for that school resource, uh, summer school program. Licensing permits, the story continues, unfortunately. Uh, building permits, which was budgeted at 900,000, actually came in at 265,000. Uh, Mr. Mason touched on, earlier on the uh, lack of development activities, um, specifically permits. Um, he also mentioned that the homes that have been sold and, and completed, um, and now we're moving into this next phase. Uh, however, there has been a significant lull in activity, and because of that, there is a significant decrease in uh, uh, revenues. Uh, electrical, plumbing, mechanical permits were all grouped in into the staff report, but I thought it would be helpful for you to see that it is across the board that they are, are just not material, they did not materialize this past year. Forty, eighty, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 difference uh, in the different categories. Fines and penalties. Um, the staff report reflected an increase recommended of 19,000, budget at 65,000. Um, today, we uh, recognize that there may be um, a, an amount due to the county, so that may have actually come in at the budgeted figure. Uh, workers' compensation and other revenue continues to, to increase. Of course, there's an offset because when there are, aren't uh, bodies on the field, there are other bodies, uh, in particular for this case, workers' compensation, um, a lot of it is concentrated in the police department, so you do see a lot of uh, overfilling and overtime and whatnot. 
Um, the grant funding that was budgeted for the police department, the check was received, but it was received in the fiscal year. So you'll see an adjustment uh, being recommended there to switch revenues to the next fiscal year. Inter intergovernmental revenue, it's an overall decrease uh, to 6,900. Um, the vehicle license fees uh, came in higher than expected. They continue to come in uh, every year. It's a nominal amount, but um, it is still positive news. The property tax payment in lieu, um, this is slightly different than what was uh, reflected in the, staff, in the staff report because uh, being on a modified accrual basis, what we do is we recognize revenue when it occurs, even if we haven't received that money yet. Um, in this case, the property tax payment in lieu had been uh, received, uh, recorded, but uh, that payment, um, there have been years where it has not been received. Um, so we are going to uh, uh, be cautious with that and leave it as is. Property related, uh, we saw an increase to traditional property tax of about $51,000 that um, was reflected in the uh, second um, budget. We actually received in the most recent uh, distribution an uh, uh, $31,000 collection amount for um, regular property taxes. So that's the majority of where that $50,000 um, variance comes from uh, in the positive. Uh, residual property tax is always budgeted at zero because it fluctuates so consistently. Um, uh, and we did see it come in at 189,000. So that's positive news of an increase of 271,000 compared to the budgeted figures. Sales tax uh, has was brought to you um, in 2021 when you adopted the budget for 21, 22, 22, 23 with COVID numbers in mind. We um, since updated those figures uh, to 3.3 and 4.2 uh, respectively to general fund and measure T. And both of those exceeded uh, the projected amounts. I apologize, there is a number missing from that uh, first general sales tax. I don't know if that was I'm not the only one that caught that, but uh, that should be at 3.4 million. Um, so general sales tax and more significantly measure T sales tax came in uh, higher than projected. We don't anticipate that that will occur again this year. One, the figures that were adopted are reflective of the the information that we're see, we saw this past year. So you're already in the 3.5 to $4.1 million for your budget. Um, and also the figures that we're seeing being received while it's the first two months, so they're based on advances. We haven't gotten the third quarter true up yet. Um, they're in line with projections. So right now we are trending towards our budget, which is great news. Other taxes had a net zero fiscal impact. Uh, oh, shoot, that oh, was not updated. Um, there was uh, a, a few line items um, in that, and I will revert back to my charts so that you can see that. I apologize for that. Um, so transient occupancy tax and real property transfer tax uh, came in just under uh, expectations. Business licenses came in over expectations, which um, netted about zero. There may be a... a bit of a increase there. Moving on to franchise fees. Uh, cable, uh, in your staff report, uh, there was uh, reflected that there was increases uh, throughout the different categories. Um, and in reality, it was with two specific franchises that um, came in at about $40,000 uh, over the budgeted amount. Um, we've double check those figures. They're based on the data that is provided by uh, those franchisees um, and it looks, looks good. So we're um, thinking that it is attributable to the new homes that have now been occupied and um, are seeing additional revenue, okay? Um, more significantly is the commercial refuse haulers, uh, which is the last quarter's uh, data or two quarters worth of data um, for the new Athens agreements when their uh, new rates kicked in, new rates and new franchise fee rates. So uh, the budget amount of $500,000 came in at $684,000 for uh, commercial refuse haulers franchise fees. Uh, while the expenditure detail here um, is minimal, that will be the main focus of your PowerPoint um, next next week. Um, 
suffice it to say, we are very under budget. The million dollars that we're short in revenues is primarily being offset by a million dollars in um, savings uh, uh, due to staff vacancies. Um, Clay and James aren't here, but all three of us have had at least 30% of our budget or 30% of our staffing that has remained vacant for the majority of the year, Clay more so, I believe, um, but he's enterprise funds. So we've had a lot of vacancies that offset um, a lot of the decreased revenues. Uh, there's also capital improvement program budget carryovers that are automatic for $4.4 million. So a few miscellaneous items related to the 22-23 uh, 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 budget figures. First, these are unaudited figures being presented. Um, second, um, you had a $2.5 million um, revenue and use of civic facilities fees for the sports park. Um, there was a $5 million need, so you also authorized an inner fund loan uh, from a miscellaneous deposit uh, related to, uh, to the development uh, agreement. Um, so that makes up $4.4 million. We will be coming to you with an additional need of an, another inner fund loan to carry, uh, cover the remaining $500,000. We do feel that we found um, a, a source for that. Um, but that will be brought back to you on November 1st. Um, that money is not uh, reflected in 2223 because we actually just this week received the final request for the remaining $500,000. So we are still on a timely basis to get that approved um, before any payments go out. Obviously, we wouldn't make the payment without the available budget. Um, second, as you noted, there was a surplus to uh, the Measure T fund and uh, the Committee will be coming back to you along with their annual report on November 1st. Uh, lastly, um, I, I stuck this in here. We'll probably meet with the Finance Committee in November to also discuss the uh, finalized figures um, uh, for the year end and for the first quarter. We typically do that right around this time. So going on to our first quarter, the first, first quarter review is always fairly light. Um, for us, uh, in, in particular as it relates to revenues, because a lot of our more significant revenue generators are running two months behind. Uh, as I noted earlier, sales tax, which is one of our, our larger um, revenue streams, um, we've only received the advances. We haven't received the actual true up yet. Uh, so, so that being said, um, we do see a slight increase um, compared to our projections, very, very minimal. Um, so at this point, we are anticipating that uh, the revenue will meet the budget. Um, the significant revenues that we were concerned would come in uh, the, the, at the end of June, that, that we noted we were relying on for this year's budget um, has not yet materialized. James touched on that earlier. We do hope to have uh, that come in this year. Our budget is very dependent on that. Um, revenue related to the upcoming bond issuance is expected to net between 10 to 25,000 in revenues related to, uh, in reimbursements related to staff time. There's also a reimbursement of $75,000 related to the work that was spent on the franchise uh, waste haulers agreement uh, that, will, that has been received uh, in this fiscal year. So we'll be coming to you with those adjustments. Workers' comp claims continue to um, uh, net us uh, revenues uh, from those uh, vacancies, vacancies, uh, temporary vacancies, and they're currently at $40,000. The good news is that we are not aware of any expenditure adjustments that are necessary at this time, apart from what uh, was already previously discussed. The last time that we came to you this time last year, um, this slide was full and it went on to the next slide. So thankfully things are trending um, in the right direction. There are two other funds that will need adjustments, one of which already appeared uh, on your staff report um, for the Transportation Development Fund. Um, that came in about $23,000 above the uh, budget that was adopted in June. 
Uh, second was uh, the COPS grant. We budgeted $160,000 in revenue for the COPS grant, and we received notification last week that the growth amount, so there's $100,000 that's a typical amount, and the remainder that's the growth amount, that came in at $83,000, which is the highest that we've seen in a significant increase from the $66,000 from last year. Um, so that's positive news. The chief um, will incorporate those adjustments either on the November 1st uh, uh, actual um, budget resolution to make adjustments to the budget or in the chief's um, reports to council. Questions, comments? Thank you, questions or comments? Um, oh, Vice Mayor. <clears throat> um, and this may be for you or for um, city manager. I know that you're looking at or working on updating fees are those yes, in those place or coming or what's? Yes, um, that process has been started. The um, consultants are, are in their work process at this time. They've okay. received all the data. Very, very grateful to the department heads who made the time out of their very busy schedules to provide us with the information that was needed. Um, we anticipate um, by the end of this year to come with the uh, overhead cost allocation uh, adjustments. Um, and then at the start of early next year um, with the uh, any other user fee and diff fee study Good. adjustments. Okay, glad to see that's coming. Yes. So Director Mason was pretty excited about all the people he might hire soon. Does that make you nervous then? As long as the revenue comes in, no, because we are yeah, on track this year. As you said, we're kind of balanced right now because we're understaffed. For last year, because last year's revenues didn't materialize. All right. And then... Uh, you know, now that we're having more new houses come online, I don't know what kind of number we would need in order to impact the sewer rates to level them off or anything like that. But It's an excellent question. We actually have a water and sewer rate study that's budgeted for uh, this fiscal year, and that'll uh, be an occurrence because I believe we're in the last uh, year of the fifth year rates that were adopted. Thank you. All right, I think we're good. Thank you very much, and thanks for hanging in there. All right, we're moving on to item 11D, the travel policy update. So this is a recommendation that council adopt resolution 7487, adopting a revised travel expense reimbursement policy established by resolution number 6258 on February 6, 2006. So, yes, and, and like the last staff report, I, I imagine that this will receive feedback. This is this is the first time in almost 18 years this this travel policy is going off to college, literally. Um, so while we are very proud of the work that our accountant, Wendy Morris, um, put into um, the the changes and recommendations to the staff report, um, we we have gone through a couple of processes, a couple of different discussions with the executive management team um, and, and received feedback and incorporated those changes. So we're more than open to any recommendations that you may have, concerns, comments, to make sure that those are addressed. Um, so that said, I do have, um, because normally when you receive a policy, an amendment to a policy or a change to the policy, this re there's a reason why that wasn't worded that way um, on this staff report, uh, because there wasn't a red line of your existing policy. The reason for that is because it is 18 years old. So what we did was we took a couple of uh, different policies from our neighboring agencies, um, took the most updated one, the one that seemed to flow the best, the city of Ventura's, used it as a basis, incorporated the best of the other uh, cities that we had access to. And in particular, the reason why this was assigned to Wendy is because she was in the accounts payable role for years and personally experienced the frustrations that came with, you know, um, the lack of clarity in the existing policy, the, the um, a, apparent um, out of step policy that we had compared to the industry standard. So we hope that that is all addressed. I do have available copies of the existing policy if there um, are any questions, but if not, I'll go ahead and get started. So we thought a lot, a lot about how to present this to you because Normally, if you're presenting a new policy, you want to provide an overview. What is the impact of staff to council in this situation? Um, but 
We also want to make sure because while it's a new to us policy, there there is an existing policy um, that is in place, and we want to make sure that we're very transparent with the changes that are um, being made compared to the old policy. So we feel we have a good mix of that in this presentation. So we're gonna go by category of what the policy uh, is intended to do and does and how that differs from the existing policy. If there are, if there's anything that I missed of significance, I tried to make sure that I included all of the most significant items in here, but please let me know, I'll be happy to um, clarify. So the first is that uh, the policy establishes a guideline for conferences, meetings, and trainings for city officials and city employees. Um, that is the very first change. One is that the prior policy, while it was um, in practice being applied to city staff, was not, uh, was not noted as being applicable to city staff. It was just for city elected and appointed officials. So this incorporates city staff there. The second is that the um, one of the introductory sections listed what the purpose was, and you know some of it was um, kind of uh, I don't want to say um, assumed, right? You're, there's a benefit to the city. You're servicing uh, the residents by going out and uh, attending these trainings, these events. Um, there was one section that um, we removed, which was very specifically did not include in the new policy, which was um, it in, uh, the old policy included language on reimbursement to council for retirement or celebration gifts to city employees, um, meaning you could go out and buy someone a gift and we would reimburse you for that. We felt that that is now covered by the employee recognition policy and, and had its own standalone policy and didn't need to be included um, or amended in this case. The second is um, that it communicated the uh, expectation of a cost-effective approach to expenses. Of course, that is always a given uh, with, with taxpayer money, um, but one, previously the academy was not, the academy and the academy training was not specifically included. It does now have its own um, section or paragraph. Um, second, uh, the, the language didn't specifically include addressing proper accounting for expenses incurred in relation to the policy. And that's something that we, especially with Wendy and her role, made sure to incorporate this time. Uh, next, it establishes travel approval authority. So in practice, the city manager already approves all travel, um, local, non-local, just not out of state travel. So. The first change that we made um, was obviously one recommending to not come to council every time there's out of state travel and let that be um, able to be approved by the city manager. However, his approval is still only limited to having the, the travel request be in line with the policy. So, uh, and budget, which is within the policy. Um, next is the city manager, again, approved everything before, and um, it is very time consuming for him, and also not necessarily necessary when someone is going down to Ventura or even within Santa Paula for a training, a lunchtime training. Um, so local travel was previously approved by the city manager. Um, it is now uh, able to be approved by the department head. And not included in here, but included in the language is and finance. Everywhere you will see and finance because uh, for every travel reimbursement, we double check just to make sure that's within the policy um, and everything looks good. Uh, same, it is limited to uh, uh, being consistent with the policy. So they don't have the authority to approve outside of that. It, the new policy, like the old policy, establishes ineligible expenses. However, in the new policy, it establishes it within its own section. In the old policy, um, it was in different sections, and you'll see that in these references. Um, alcohol remains ineligible. Um, it, ironically, is 8C in both sections. Family travel, spouse dependents um, remains the same, ineligible, previously in a different section than what it is now. It's in its own section. Uh, personal portions of trips remains the same. Um, there's a little bit more clarifying language in terms of um, how to address personal portions of trips, um, but in reality, absolutely no change. Uh, we did remove that charitable events were ineligible because 
Many of the events that you attend are community events that can also be viewed as charitable events. Um, so we felt that that was okay to remove. Um, and we also removed language that was covered by other sections of the policy, and we'll go get into that in a second. Next is per diem or uh, meal reimbursements. Uh, the first is re we remove specific references. So instead of referring to um, a couple of different websites, we just refer to the GSA uh, government website. Instead of saying the specific amount, which changes uh, every couple years, we just said refer to the GSA website. So just to try to streamline that a bit. Um, we identified meal eligibility because uh, that is something that was previously um, a, a point of contention, um, or not contention, but questions from staff and, and the finance. Um, so it does specifically define breakfast. Um, there is always this idea of, well, they provided it, but I didn't want it. That the city does not cover you if you do not want what is provided. However, there is one exception, um, and that is continental breakfast. We define that continental breakfast is considered breakfast, um, but we did provide some flexibility um, to have it be approved by the city manager if, because continental breakfast can mean different things for different people. It could be a true continental breakfast, or it can be a banana with a cup of coffee. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that if that's the situation, that we're able to have some leniency there. It's very controversial. You'd be surprised how often these questions come up um, and, and have feedback, have pushback. Um, uh, next is the tip, the tip amount, um, which was 15% and was very normal and in, uh, generous in 2006. Um, things have changed in the industry, and that does lean towards um, 18%. I think the city manager can attest to this. I can attest to this. We are... We are rule followers, and we say 15% is 15%. So at times, we have to bill 23 cents or $1.26 or whatever it may be because the 15% has been exceeded. So we felt that 18% was a more reasonable amount for a tip amount. Well, since you're talking about that, because it seems the norm is 20% now, but you had mentioned that it's pre-tax. So then I thought maybe the 18% that is like 20%, depending on how you look at it. I don't know, but. Um, next, so uh, this one uh, is a significant change, in, in my opinion, um, that per diem is applicable to travel outside of a 50-mile radius, or it should be a 100-mile radius, 50 miles from the starting point um, is how that should be phrased. So previously, um, someone could go to Ventura. We have had requests for a, a lunch reimbursement for a meeting in Santa Paula, a, a training in Santa Paula uh, by another, another agency. It's not the industry standard. Um, we do see this um, in other cities that tends to be per diem out for, for non-local travel. Um, so that being said, per diem is being recommended to be outside of a 50 mile radius. We um, considered uh, within Ventura County, we considered a lot of different items um, or a lot of different options, but this felt uh, like a good compromise um, between what we're seeing in different cities. Um, next is we did include language uh, to provide, again, flexibility to um, cover a higher per diem amount if the travel is to high cost cities. Thankfully, the GSA, this is not uh, abnormal, the GSA does cover that and address that and provides per diem rates uh, for different counties. For mileage reimbursement, we remove specific uh, references again. Um, and second, we established what is uh, eligible for reimbursement. Um, there was a lack of clarity on whether um, those with an auto allowance would receive a uh, reimbursement um, because in theory the auto allowance is really um, you know local travel you're going to these different meetings but then those who would travel to san diego or would travel to up north to fresno or whatever that's obviously much more significant um, travel um, so we um, again like the per diem recommended that if you receive a lot of auto allowance um, and you're traveling far you can request um, uh, mileage reimbursement, but you have to deduct the first 100 miles. So 
that non-local travel that we established uh, of 50 miles out has to be deducted. Um, we do have a new section for the police academy, which I'll pass along to the city manager. Thank you, Christy. Um, so new to the policy that's being recommended is the opportunity to um, consider some parameters for the participation of recruits in our police department that um, are going into the academy. And historically, or at least in recent history, um, the rule of thumb, because there was no guidance, was that the police chief would kind of decide where they would send people. And that created a lot of inconsistency. And I think that started, and of course, Council Member Juarez can talk to it further, but I think that started when um, Chief McLean had sent some, at least one student to the academy here in Ventura County, and the person didn't pass. And the academy, you know, doesn't have a success rate of 100%. So there's a lot of students that go in and they don't make it. And, and I think it kind of, um, I think it bothered him. And so he started sending kids down to, um, Del to uh, Rio Hondo, I think. And then when Chief Walker got here, he was familiar with the academy out in Riverside. So he sent kids to Riverside. And the problem was not only that they were going far distances, and away from peers and family and our observation because we like to go check in to see how they're doing because it's a mentoring opportunity. But also then they're not graduating with a class that's likely to be in the region. Uh, whereas when Council Member Juarez graduated, you know, he's, he's still got graduating class members that are in other agencies, including our own here. And um, those are important relationships. So. Sending people too far away was expensive and it wasn't convenient. Um, Post reimburses us for a good bit of the expense of the academy, but it's, it's not a, a set formula. And so this policy is recommended to direct that we are primarily using our local academy here in Ventura County, that if that is not available, either from a timing perspective or because it's filled up, um, that we would always look for academies that are closest to us so that we would be minimizing cost. And um, Council Member Juarez and I talked about maybe it should also kind of say minimizing distance in there and we can, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Council Member Crosswhite suggested minimizing distance too um, as a parameter. So that this guideline would help give direction to the police chief and the department on where people are, are going. And that is my presentation, but if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Council, Council Member Horace. I can go ahead, sorry. I'll try to be brief. Um, well, Dan, thank you very much for summarizing. I was gonna, you know, say what if you didn't, but I really appreciate you, you making those comments. But I do want to, Send accolades to Christy Ramirez. She was phenomenal, but it took a while. And Chief, this, some of this information is, might be new to him because you know he's been on for just a few months, but I actually requested this a year and a half ago when Council Member Rise was here because he was the, you know, the chief of police, or chief fire chief in charge of training and I was in charge of training for the police department. So we knew there was things that weren't being done as economically as we could have done it, and we wanted to get that information to offer suggestions. I didn't realize that we hadn't had a policy update in 18 years. That's that's just unbelievable. But it, it did take uh, some time, and when I spoke to city manager upon occasion, it almost seemed there was reluctance for the police department, or maybe some reluctance, but also, you know, post works in arrears, and it takes a while for them to reimburse, and you know, staffing and everything else. But uh, the fact that um, it took this long, Rick Arise is gone, he's been gone 10 months and you know he didn't get to share this, but I did want to first of all just share with him and then come up with some suggestions and then this turned into a travel and training policy, but I, I think it turned out to be beneficial because it really answered a lot of questions that were lingering out there. Uh, what I didn't see and I did realize that you know it, it tries to summarize the, the parameters by which we'll center recruits, but uh, some other concerns that I had, and, and I, I don't, 
I don't know if Chris Ramirez or Director Ramirez has the answers, but you start thinking about sending somebody 17 miles to an academy versus, you know, Riverside, um, uh, Real Hondo Academy in Whittier, and not just for a turnaround trip. You know, it was the travel, the um, the uh, lodging, the per diem, uh, time away from family, and then you don't even start thinking about you know the wear and tear on the cars, the fuel, um, you know, just the fact they're away from family and friends. And I don't know, Mr. Ramirez, if you have some kind. Of, I think you mentioned some figure, but um, as to you know how much more we spent by sending. Yes. Um, so when you requested that analysis, we determined that um, when the recruits were sent to Ventura. Uh, there was a zero dollar cost associated because we didn't cover lodging. We didn't cover, you know, it's it's in our county. Um, when they went to Rio Hondo uh, for four people, it was a ten thousand dollar cost uh, due to lodging for uh, months on end. Um, however, uh, credit to those those recruits, they um, were bunked up, so that uh, was a, still a savings. Um, this past uh, San Bernardino um, expense was forty thousand dollars. How many? Four, Three. four, four. Pretty sure it was four. And if you, and I think there was one point we had males and females, so they had to bunk separate. Yes. So, <clears throat> uh, but again, just the impact of of uh, camaraderie and being away from your family. Can you imagine leaving for five days a week, being with people, studying, and then just coming home to reacquaint yourself with your family, and then driving to drive back, and then considering portal to portal, right? They are not going to drive there for free, so they get either a straight time or overtime, you know, after they get out of the academy to drive home and drive down and, you know, how much per day to, for meals. And, yeah, some of that's reimbursed, but I don't think post reimbursed is 100%. No, I believe their amount is $75 per day, um, correct, Chief? And then there's different post reimbursements. Mm -hmm. So $75 max per day. So, anyway, just to summarize, I really appreciate that this came forth and now it's in a policy and updated, not just for the police department, for where else. Could it be tweaked a little bit? Absolutely, but you know, uh, when the new chief comes in, when the new chief comes in, you know, maybe these things will be uh, uh, f um, refined a little bit better. But thank you very much, Dan, for finally getting this and Christy and the chief, and we move on. Well, just a question related to that. So wh what percent of the time could they not go to the county? Right, so our goal is to try and send them local, but it sounds well, like that's not a given. The issue, and, and the chief can come up and speak to it, but the issue is often one of timing, but then also the, the number of slots that are available. Um, if you want to espouse on that. Sure, so uh, the Ventura County Academy uh, has recruits starting in April, and then six months goes by, they graduate, and the next opportunity is in October. So there's two opportunities through the year for us to send recruits locally. Um, if we're hiring a lot of people and we need to get them hired as soon as possible, if our allocations or our staffing is way low, um, we may not be able to wait till October or the following April. Uh, so there, that, that would be a, a situation where we could find uh, Rio Hondo or a closer academy, be LA Sheriff's and um, Santa, uh, Santa Clarita area. Uh, that would be an opportunity for us, depending on the timing and the amount of people we're trying to hire uh, to maintain our staffing. Thank you. And, and in this particular circumstance, it could have been a um, not a matter of timing, but of decision. In other words, the academy, there's too close in timing, but you know we're going to choose to send them where you know. They may have had successes in the past in Whittier or San Bernardino versus Ventura County Sheriff's Academy. So. Thank you. Councilman Crossway. Well, the chief is still up here. Um, is, do you have any reason why adding, so it's here, uh, it says, uh, in the event an accredited post academy outside Ventura County is selected, every effort to minimize adding distance and cost instead of just cost. Is there any reason why you have an issue with every effort should be made to minimize distance. Um, I mean, it's, it's not saying you must, it's just saying every effort should be made. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm agreeable to that. I, yeah, it's appropriate. All right. I just figured if I, was gonna if I was gonna request that we add it, I just wanted to figure since you were up here already. Sure. Right. Thank you. Sounds great. 
Just for clarification, the priority would still be costs because if it's one's closer but more expensive. Okay. Right, just one cost and distance. So, yeah, the cost would come first. Thank you, Chief. Any other comments, questions? Uh, I provided a few that is that don't change the substance to the city manager. So, yeah, and that was mostly around consistency, where it might say city manager or finance director or and finance director. There's a few places where that's missing, or designee, and there's a few places where that might be missing. So we'll just comb through that if the city attorney is agreeable that council can adopt tonight, but we'll make those minor edits. Um, if somebody could make a motion, that would al also allow for technical corrections. And then if the proposed addition of and distance to section 17 is also amenable, then that also should be included in the motion. Thank you. Somebody want to do a motion? Here. As long as no one else is. Go for it. All right. Um, I would move uh, staff recommendation that we adopt resolution 7487, adopting a revised travel expense reimbursement policy established by resolution number 6258 on February 6, 2006, um, with the technical, the ability of staff to make the technical edits um, necessary and also um, adding uh, the language of distance after cost in section 17 um, with the understanding that cost is the priority um, but we all most likely distance also minimizes cost. I would uh, second that mayor. Aye. We will move on to item number 12, uh, future agenda items. Anybody, uh, Council Member Horace. Thank you, Mayor. Well, in compliance with our newly adopted policy and procedures, uh, the only thing that is of an urgency matter, but I've already brought it to the mayor's attention, is a proclamation for the centennial for Rotary, which is they'll, they'll, we'll be having our centennial celebration on Friday, November 17th. So we would like it presented either that Wednesday or the, the two weeks Wednesday before that. And the only other item, in case other council members are thinking about it, I'd like to, I'd, I've gotten a couple of calls about drones. And, you know, some a neighbor said that he thinks some of his neighbors recording him through a drone. So, and I asked Jonathan if we have a policy and he didn't think we had one. And I don't, Chief, yeah, so I don't think we have one. So it's not an urgency, but I think it's something we should consider. Uh, and then that's something if you were interested, you could use our new formal process too. Mm, yeah, I'm going to su submit, but in case anybody else is thinking about it. And then also Councilmember Crosswhite and I, uh, she brought up some new information on the legalities of the speed surveys. And we might request future, or well, we're going to request a future agenda item for a re-evaluation of some of the increased speed limits. Because, so, and then not an urgency, but we think that's important. All right. All right. Well, so, I will move on to item 13. I will go ahead and adjourn the City of Santa Paula regular meeting um, for the City Council this Wednesday, October 18th at 11, quarter after 11. I, oh, I had a quarter after 11. Yeah.